Welcome to Entrepreneur's Podcast, the podcast for developpreneurs, the podcast where you get to be a fly on the wall listening to real conversations of three developers trying to tackle the challenges they face as entrepreneurs. This episode of the Entrepreneur's is brought to you by DigitalOcean, the easiest way to get up and running with a Linux VPS in less than a minute. Seriously, it's incredibly fast and incredibly simple to get started with Linux on DigitalOcean. We run the entreprogrammers.com website off of our DigitalOcean server, and I personally run a couple of other websites off of there. I run Watch Me Code, I run the Signal Leaf blog, and I run the DerekBailey.com blog off of DigitalOcean servers. And they couldn't be better. I've never had a single problem with them. I've always had reliable service. They're incredibly fast. They're all SSD based, so they're going to run super fast on the back end when they're actually doing some data data crunching, and they have a terabyte of bandwidth for your default usage every given month. That's a ton of bandwidth. There's no way I'm hitting anywhere near that kind of bandwidth for the $5 a month that I'm spending or $10 a month that I'm spending in a couple of cases. With over 400,000 developers, including the entre programmers that they're currently serving, DigitalOcean will run your production applications and your personal projects like you would not believe. And you can get started for just five bucks a month with details on the pricing listed at digitalocean.com. But it gets even better because if you use the promo code entre programmers, you're going to get a $10 credit. So you're effectively going to get two months worth of free service by using the entre programmers promo code at digitalocean.com. So check them out. They're an amazing service full of great people, excellent tutorials, and by far the easiest way to get a Linux VPS up and running to run your personal products, your production applications, and so much more. Hey, John Sanmez here. Just thought I would take a moment to thank one of the sponsors for this week's episode of Entre Programmers, Raygun. Io. really thank Raygun.io for sponsoring this podcast. And if you don't know what Raygun.io is, I definitely recommend that you check it out. If you've ever been in the situation where you're trying to get all of these user error messages and logs and stack traces from your application out of some log file and then try to sort it all out and maybe you dump that into a SQL database or something like that, you need Raygun.io. It, it just makes things simple. What it basically does is it lets you find and fix bugs before the users even encounter them so you can see your stack traces you can see that no pointer exception or that uh, that exception that got thrown before a user happens to see it and it's all in one big dashboard where you can just group things and and check them off as you fix them and you can even communicate with users right from there so it, it's gonna save you time and money you know developer time is expensive you don't want to be wasting that going through log files and trying to come up with your own homegrown solutions it, it integrates error reporting and monitoring into your development workflow so you can have assurance that your your releases are error free and it has full stack monitoring lets you monitor errors across your entire application it supports all languages and platforms yes that's right all languages and platforms so whether it's a node.js backend or javascript front end you've, you've got it all in one place so check out raygun.io and thanks again to raygun.io for sponsoring this week's episode of entre programmers we're live. We're live. <laughs> We're so, on fire. All right, so Jack, like you, you, you okay. said you said you got to go early, so we should probably start with you then. Yeah, I'm tired of conferences. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. <laughs> I, I feel it. Just, I'm just getting this like uh, this this John Travolta kind of like um, Pulp Fiction vibe from you, Chuck. Just I mean, it might be like the ambiance. They're just like that. You've got to go in 45 minutes, so you're wearing all black. I, I don't know. <laughs> it's not all black. There are words on this shirt. Oh, okay. Oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it was it was terrific here at RailsConf. Um, lots of people which usually kind of wears me out by the end of the conference, and it mm -hmm. did, but um, I just, I met a ton of people that listened to the, the podcasts, and I got a ton of great ideas for Rails clips. Nice. Um, you know, it's, I went to some of the talks, and they were fine, you know, some of them were really good, but yeah, it's it's the connections, it, it's a huge thing here, and just, right. you know, being able to talk to people and find out what they're about, find out what they're struggling with, find out what they, um, you know, what makes them tick and what makes a difference, yeah. Um, if you're trying to reach an audience, go to the conference for that audience and, yeah. and talk to them. And then, and then you can start to figure out, okay, here's what's going on. I also have to say that uh, 
just spreading the word about Rails Clips, I got a lot of positive feedback from people who want something like that. So, um, you know, again, it was it was just a terrific way to validate some ideas and talk to some people and really kind of get some feedback on it. So, have cool. you tried anything to like collect leads? <laughs> just curious if uh, it's I, it's something I would like to try at, at a conference like that. Well, oh, but it that also would be awkward. Idea. Huh. Yeah, I mean, like, I did it at my talk with that Android tablet. I yeah. Took about a hundred, hundred and fifty email addresses at the last. Nice. Yeah, that's that's actually something I hadn't really thought about, even though, <laughs> even though John had talked about it. But yeah, um, that yeah, that would have been a great idea. Just, you know. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Well, it's not too late. You could you can just roam around the the uh, the airport for a while. You know. Right. Just talk to random strangers in the airport. That's right. Were you at RailsCon? <laughs> can I get your email address anyway? <laughs> By the way, I just got off the phone with with um, you know that that health hero company that I'm the tech advisor on, right. and, and and Anthony, the CEO, was just asking me about. He said, "Should I switch my technology from Ruby to something else? Because I can't seem to find any Ruby developers." Really? And then I was like, <laughs> I, I was like, "There's definitely lots of Ruby developers out there." And they just <laughs> to me, I'm like, "Dang it! I should just need to ask Chuck." <laughs> yeah, but. I mean, how how could you not find Ruby developers? You, you must be looking in the wrong places and not offering enough money. Oh yeah, yeah. I know plenty of contractors that are decent developers that are either uh, getting started or are at least looking for a company to work for. So yeah. Okay. Yeah, we should we should talk. Uh, we'll have to talk this week. Or you maybe should I definitely just... switch to Java. There's a lot of Java developers out there. This is cool. <laughs> Cobalt's yeah, you making could... a comeback, man. Oh yeah, Cobalt. <laughs> well, he was talking about going Node, and I was like, I was like, you know, I said Node's great, but like, don't switch your whole technology because you can't find Ruby. Yeah, that's, that's when Ruby's still one of the most switch. popular right. things. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe, uh, maybe I'll, uh, maybe we can talk, Chuck, or or maybe I can just directly connect you with. Yeah. With Anthony, because uh, yeah, he's he's got a good. I mean, and he's you know he's not paying a huge huge amount, but uh, but I think there's. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure we can find somebody that'll work for him. Yeah. Unless he's a total cheapskate or something, but Yeah. It sound like it, so startups. Jeez. <laughs> Wait, startup. He he should be like throwing money at people. He's yep. he's getting paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to throw hundreds of thousands of dollars at people. <laughs> I mean, the, the whole point of having a startup yeah. is just to overprice everyone uh, and, and throw yeah. way too much money at people in the hopes that you'll make it big. So Well, he's getting funding now. He's bootstrapped at this point. Oh, okay. So, bootstrapped. And, and the funding yeah. round isn't going to be that that huge. So right. yeah, it's, yeah. yeah. Sounds like he's running a non-insane startup. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so I've got to go home now and put all of the stuff that I learned at RailsConf into practice, and all the stuff I learned at MicroConf into practice. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. So yeah. So Eighty twenty cool. rule, man. What what of the things? What of all of the things that you learned will have eighty percent of the impact that you want? Just do do the twenty percent of the things that you learned that will have eighty percent of the impact, and forget about the rest. Yeah, I think it's really going to come down to sponsorships and Rails clips at this point. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a way to get... Sorry, I'm still back on the lead thing. Is there a way to get a list of people that came to the conference? If you're a sponsor, you could. Really? Yeah. Are you serious? Sponsors get a list of people that came? It Most depends often. on the conference. Well, yeah, yeah it Holy depends crap. on the conference, but... I I've, totally I've, sponsor conferences. <laughs> I, I've I've done that a number of times. I was you know do do a small sponsorship with a conference and get a list of email addresses. That That's... alone is worth the price of sponsorship for most conferences. Wow. Yeah. I mean, hell, I could I if I get a list of like a thousand people that attend a conference, I know I can sell at least three of them, right. and that pays for the sponsorship. Even even if the even if the conference won't give you the list, most of them will at least send out a promotional email for you if you sponsor. Hmm. I and, should and at talk that to those point, guys. You, can, you can pretty much say, "Hey, look, my promotional email is going to be getting people to sign up for my list." Yeah. 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 No, I should totally talk to those guys because I I know all of the organizers. Yeah. Um, that's that's actually a really awesome idea. You could do a retroactive sponsorship. <laughs> well, it would be 
<laughs> it would be a killer, yeah, reach. Yeah. And then the other thing is, is I, I should probably go back to Ryan Bates and a few of the other folks out there and say, hey, is there any way that you can tell your subscribers about me? Right. Yeah. I, yeah. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. Uh, with the if you do get the list, I wouldn't like cold email all of them. I would. No. I would right. email them individually. Um, yeah. And there's ways to do that. Like like actually, I've been. Like with the 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 CRM that I'm using now, um, uh, it's really easy to do that. You can you do like a mail merge or something. Yeah, like a mail merge, and it's a per basically a personal email. So. So I, I did a, a deal with um, Avdi from Ruby Tapas last year, where we we basically swapped email lists. He sent out a message to his list about Watch Me Code. I sent out a message to to my list about Ruby Tapas, and and we offered discounts to each other. Uh, mm -hmm. We could do something like that for for uh, Rails clips as well, and even have it set up in my subscriber benefit area. I'm I'm trying to get Avdi to agree to that as well, to list. Um, so we could list Rails clips, you know, with a, with a, a small discount for the first mm -hmm. month or whatever you want to do inside of the subscriber benefits for Watch Me Code, and that'll help drive some people. Yeah. So there's there's lots of plenty of opportunity for for trading email lists like you were talking about. Yeah. The the issue that I have is that, I mean, I I have a list that I'm building for Ruby uh, Ruby Rogues and JavaScript Jabber that I could you know reach right. out to, but. I probably don't have a wide enough reach to make it really juicy and tempting for some of these larger... Yeah. And so then I'm exploiting a friendship, you know. <laughs> Can you do me a favor? <laughs> yeah. What are, what are friendships for if not exploitation? I mean, come totally. on. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I do, I do have other kinds of reach that I can, you know, offer in return, so... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There's all, I always use this rule. It's like... Uh, whenever doing business with a friend, you have to know who's doing the favor, right? Because because yeah. both people assume they're they're they're, they're <laughs> receiving the favor, right? And and there, there there should always just be one person. It's like you're either doing someone a favor or they're doing you a favor, and it's right. just clearly defined. Mm -hmm. um, because That's otherwise, okay. it's like you get into this weird situation where it's like, especially like like if you're gonna hire someone to do some work, and they're like, yeah. oh, you, you know, the one person thinks, oh, you're doing me a, a favor by by working at a discounted rate, or you know, or doing <laughs> right, right. And then the right. other person thinks, oh, you're doing me a favor by by hiring me to to, to by giving me some additional work. Right, right. It's like, no, you gotta decide which is it. <laughs> yeah. What's even worse when you when you switch that, where both sides think I'm doing you a favor. Exactly. Right. <laughs> yep. Like, oh, I'm doing you a favor by giving you a discount. Well, I'm doing you a favor by giving you work. Yeah, and 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 and, and some people say, well, then you should. It should just be a business deal. No yeah, one should totally. be doing anyone a favor, and that's not true either. Because then it, you should just define. Okay, this right. time I'm doing you a favor, and this is what the favor is. Yeah. And, yeah. Then, and then it's just clear up front. That's that's what I found works the best. Because yeah, like, okay, and and it can be cool. mutual as well. Because with my current client. You know, quite frankly, I'm doing my, my friend a favor by giving him a discounted rate. He mm -hmm. knows that I am as well, but I'm totally fine with that because he's done me a huge favor of giving me steady work for mm -hmm. pretty much as long as I want to work there. And I, so, I, I mean, it's, it's a phenomenally good deal for both of us, and it, it, it's worked out really well. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. But there were a few other things that I realized here. One or one other thing that I did was I did a meetup on Wednesday night after, after the conference. Mm -hmm. Nice. And I had about 10 people show up, which was kind of nice. But it was, it turned out that I, I really met kind of the my uh, diehard fans. Right. And, you know, so we, we wound up going and getting dinner afterward, and I picked up the bill and, you know, things like that. I mean, it's just, yeah, I, I really got to meet some people that were just, you know, they're, they're kind of the people that... Are going to go out and evangelize yep. what I'm doing, and right. it was yeah. I mean, the whole thing was just awesome. So that's another avenue that I'm looking at pursuing because I know that they're going to be sharing and sharing and sharing my stuff. Nice, nice. So, how many? Curious. How many people were at the conference? About fifteen hundred. Okay. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty big. That's yeah. a good idea. I was just talking to someone about doing meetups, and the idea is like, well. Because the question came up of what is the financial benefit or like what's your ROI? 
And really, the mm-hmm. thing about doing the in-person meetups is that you create these super fans, like that, mm-hmm. you know, because then they're like, "Oh, I met, I met so and so in person." Like mm-hmm. that, they might be on your email yeah. list mm-hmm. or you know, listen to your podcast. And then once they meet you in person, then they're a super fan. And once they're a super yeah. fan, they're evangelizing. Uh, well, plus, I mean, plus if you're already there, I mean, the, the ROI, there's no additional investment, yeah. right? Right. <laughs> so right. Very little. It's kind of, a, it's like. Yeah, whether you it's just a matter of where you're hanging out and talking to people. Well, yeah. it cost me $140 for dinner. Okay, well. <laughs> but but that, I think you'll get $140 worth of value. Oh, yeah. yeah. It yeah. cost him 840 Yeah, right. I went, oh, no, oh, $140? Oh, I think said 840 Oh, 140 yeah, that's... Yeah. that's yeah. No, I, I dropped $1,000 at a conference to, to, to pay for dinner for, like, 65 people once, and... <laughs> But that was like sixty-five people. Put it on my yeah. credit card. Yeah, I, I'm not. I did. It was. It was. It was. It was a crazy situation. But yeah. But the other thing is, is that, um, and and I don't want it to come across as you know we're talking about business, so we're kind of couching that in those terms. Right. But I was already friends with two of them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And um, I got to be friends with the other three that we went to dinner with, and got to have really meaningful conversations with the other folks. So it wasn't just a, hey, look. Look what I did, but it really right. was. I mean, it was very valuable in building a relationship with these folks and understanding how I can make a difference for them. So. Right. Right. Yeah. I, I always worry that when when we talk about some of this stuff, that people miss the nuance where it's like, yeah, you, they're people, and it was good. Yeah. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. I think most people that you know they they understand that word. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. So. Yeah, overall, it was just, it was awesome. Cool. Thanks. So that was my week. <laughs> <laughs> so my week's been been pretty interesting. I've, uh, aside from uh, the client work that I've been doing, I've pretty much focused my entire week on working on this RabbitMQ package. My ebook is all but done. Uh, it's I I would probably call it like 99% done at this point. I nice. need to publish a new version of it uh, with edits that I did yesterday. And then I've spent quite a bit of time working on the interviews that I, I got set up. So I recorded three interviews so far this week. Um, I've got one of them transcribed already. I'm about to put together the audio file for the other two so I can send those off for transcription. I'm working on an intro video clip for for the interviews that'll have the Watch Me Code logo and say Watch Me Code presents the Rabbit MQ series or the Rabbit MQ interviews or something like that and have some you know fancy little animation to as an intro for for each of these interviews. Uh, and the the interviews have gone phenomenally well. Like like all three of them that I've done, I've walked away with a ton of knowledge that I wouldn't have got anywhere else. So nice. these are going to be incredibly nice. valuable interviews for, for people that are getting into RabbitMQ. I mean, can, you say a little, can you say a little more about that? I've been curious about, I haven't really looked at too many of these packages where they have interviews in them, when, mm-hmm. especially when it's technical. What right. type of what type of stuff is coming out that is useful? Because it's hard to talk about code. In- yeah, yeah. So we don't we don't talk about code so much. We talk more in abstract terms for sure. But it's it's ideas that you can run with really easily. So I, I picked each of the people in this interview series based on what I know about their strengths. So the first guy I interviewed, he deals with an architectural idea called CQRS, Command Query Res- Responsibility mm-hmm. Segregation. So we talked about the, the notion of having your write data model, where you write your information as the master record, be completely separate from your read data model, which is a denormalized view, set of views into that, that master data record, and how messaging is involved in doing that. Uh, I, the second person I interviewed, um, she's an expert in um, designing for failure, essentially, dealing with everything in your system crashing. And so we talked about how uh, queuing, message queues, and other types of queues uh, work in, in this design for failure 
situation, and we ended up talking about things like cap theorem, consistency and availability, and the, the trade-off that you have between those two things. And she actually helped me solve one of my current production problems, or at least <laughs> gave me some ideas for, for it to solve one of my current production problems for my client, which is pretty awesome. Nice. Um, then the third person that I interviewed this morning was the, the CEO of cloudamqp.com. So with him, I, in, uh, we, we talked all about production uh, uh, needs for, for RabbitMQ with uh, clustering and failover and how you, need, you know when you need to do clustering versus buying a larger machine. So I got a lot of really good information about those topics and, and how to make all of that stuff actually work. And again, it's very high-level information. It's, it's not like we're getting down to, to code and details, but we are you know, mentioning very specific pieces of technology and configurations and you know, things to look for, metrics to, to monitor, things like that. So it is all actionable information and, and valuable information in order to give people the right direction to head when they need to look into this kind of information. Yeah. So that's that, that's that's really what I've been doing this week, and it's it's been a lot of fun, honestly. I've 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 been really energized by this work, especially writing the book. I've got I put some really fun chapters into the book, and it's 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 pretty much done. I've been debating whether or not I want to write a ninth chapter as one more final chapter, but I I'm I'm probably going to call call it good as is. Um, I've also got all of my um, uh, benefits and discounts put into the end of the ebook. So anybody that buys the ebook is going to get these discount codes from Manning and from Cloud AMQP and, and these other things that I have going on nice. for additional resources. And then the, you know, of course the, the videos are going to all be a part of the big uh, package, but I've mentioned little bits and pieces about the screencasts and the ebook in some of these um, interviews that I've done so far. And I've got uh, at least three more interviews lined up. I have uh, an author of a book that I love. I have um, a big name person in um, uh, uh, the .NET world with uh, messaging systems and, and architecture around that. And then I've got a person that wrote the RabbitMQ library that I use in Node.js that I'll be interviewing. And I'm hoping to get at least one more big name person um, an author or something like that that I'm, I'm trying to get lined up. But six would be a pretty good number to have as it is. Yeah. So I, think, I think this is going to turn out really well for me. Oh, I also I wrote a blog post this week announcing the whole package and what I'm doing with it, and I've had some pretty good responses from that. Got a lot of tweets out of it, several people basically saying, shut up and take my money. Yeah. <laughs> all, all kinds awesome. of... All, all kinds of, of, of good reactions. So I'm, I'm thinking about doing pre-sales on this pretty soon. Um, I, wanna, I might put up a, a, a landing page that allows you to, to throw money at me as a pre-sale and offer a pretty hefty discount as a pre-sale to generate some interest and help fund some of the things that I'm doing, like the, the transcripts and other things like that. So I actually, actually wanted to ask you guys about that. I, I know, John, you did pre-sales for your, your – which course was it? The How to Market Yourself. Yeah, How to Market Yourself. And you had some, some constraints around that, like you stopped doing it a certain amount of time before the big thing launched? Well, yeah. So, so there's a couple of things that are different. So when are you planning on launching? I don't have a hard date yet because it kind of depends on – how quickly I can get the interviews done, and how quickly I can put the marketing material together. But it's going to be a couple weeks or a few weeks, it's, not It's probably going to be, yeah, it's, it's probably going to be end of May. That would be my guess right now. Okay. I, if it's end of May, I really wouldn't do a pre-sale at all. Really? Like, the reason why I did pre-sale was, was purely for content. market validation. <laughs> okay. But, yeah, because mm -hmm. because I wasn't sure if people were going to buy this, and it was my first thing, and I way right. underpriced it too, like at seventy five bucks. Right. Uh, so well, remember, at the time you were selling a piece of paper that said exactly, <laughs> "I will deliver your ebook." I owe you. <laughs> and I was three months out. I was three months out, or like okay. four months out. So, so that was, uh, so yeah. So I I don't know if I would do a pre sale if I if I were you. 
um, I would just I, I what I would do is pre-launch content. I would I would yeah. hype it up. I do a few blog posts, a couple yep. of videos, leak a few of the pieces of the interviews right. on your YouTube channel and it, it within blog Ooh, posts. Um, build up to it and then have a really good launch sequence and launch a week, and right. then and, and 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 then and then make that a discount. Not you know not a really huge discount, but put put in the you know twenty percent discount or whatever it is that you end right. up deciding on there um, because I think you're gonna hurt yourself in the long run if you do the pre-launch, especially with something this targeted like with Rabbit MQ. Like yeah. if someone's on your list yeah. and they're Rabbit MQ, they're going to buy this thing. You know, right. so That's fair. Um, so your price isn't gonna matter as much. Um, another really just awesome thing I think about what you're doing here is that. Uh, I think this is going to be perfect for paid traffic, uh, just because yeah, know, the perfect keyword, you know, Rabbit MQ, and it's just going to be easy to promote because it's so targeted, right? Uh, so, mm -hmm. yeah. right, and, and I, I decided on on the name of the package being Rabbit MQ for developers, yeah, because that's that's really the the focus is is people is is developers that want to get into this because I think a lot of developers see things like Rabbit MQ as you know systems and architecture and stuff that's right. outside of of their responsibility and in, in purview and I I don't really think that's true at all and I'm hoping that having having a title like Rabbit MQ for developers will first of all give it a little bit of focus for who the audience is but also allow more developers to really understand that yes this is something that you can and should be looking into because it, it'll make your life that much easier yeah but uh, but yeah yeah. But yeah you have some good points about about not doing a, a pre-sale mm -hmm. I definitely want to do blog posts leading up to this I've been thinking about that I'm doing transcripts for all of these interviews and yeah. I'm planning on having bits and pieces of these interviews going into some of the blog posts. What I really want to do um, long term, may maybe even for, for part of the build up, is take out various themes from the interview transcripts. So like I've, I've had two people talk about cap theorem already. So I could easily take cap theorem out of the, the interviews and put together a short blog post just about cap theorem and have quotes from these two experts that I've interviewed and have some of my own description in there and then at the end of it talk about the full package, you know, advertise the, the full Rabbit MQ deal that I've got going on. So I think there's there's a lot of opportunity for for using the content to to create more content and reuse of the content and advertise this. I I really like the idea about putting bits and pieces of the interviews up on YouTube as well. I can start leaking those in short segments, you know, three or four minutes a piece up on YouTube over a period of time, and that'll start driving traffic and attention as well. And once I get this animation that I'm building for the video intros, it'll be it'll be a pretty good looking looking setup. Cool, awesome, nice. So, nice are nice. you doing any kind of email drip campaign to market this or to prep people for it? So I will be primed at the launch. I, I'm not yet, but I will be. Um, I've, I've, I'm going to be putting together a full launch sequence uh, for this, which will include um, some emails leading up to the actual launch and sale, similar to what I've done in the past, where I have a bunch of really good information and say, you know, okay, now you've read all about it for the last week or whatever. It's available for sale. Go buy it. And then I want to have some continuing emails during that launch week to, to give people additional information, similar to what I did with my, uh, my ExpressJS launch, where I had educational material in there. Because I, I think that one, by far, it was, was my most successful launch. I brought in like $2,500 from that one, and it didn't take a whole lot of work to put that together. So putting more effort into this one and having having things more focused and 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 thought out, I think I'll be able to bring in a pretty good chunk of change with this. And then all of those launch sequence emails will turn into a, a long-term drip campaign, similar yeah. to how I did the the ExpressJS Pro Tips. I'll I'll figure out what the email course is gonna the drip course is gonna look like for the long-term paid traffic that John mentioned a minute ago and start 
start setting that up and start getting traffic flowing through that after after the the launch is done and and settled down. So right. I agree with John about about not doing a pre-sale, but let me throw out a, a little twist on that. Okay. Um, you might want to do a, uh, a a very limited pre-sale to like oh. ten people. Yeah. Seriously, okay. cap it at ten. All right. With a high, yeah. Uh, right. And keep the price keep the price decent. You know, like maybe right. make it a discount off of what you're going to be charging, but it's called it a beta launch or something. Sure. And then those people, the condition is they have to give you reviews. Okay. Of, Feedback, because that will be that will be that's the hardest thing about launching a product like this is there's yeah. no social proof. So if you can get that ahead of time and you can include that in your emails, right. you know, like after you after like kind of like once you open the cart to right. um to say you know this thing's available for sale, the next e email should probably include some sort of like social proof, like gotcha. Yeah, you know, mm -hmm. I got this and it was amazing, and it's really hard to do that if you don't have. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've got a little time. bit of that because I have had a number of really positive responses to the screencasts already. But okay. I, I like the idea because yeah. it'll be, you know, more focused or, or more yeah. broad about the full package, I think. I yeah, think. Oh, I try to make it specific. I mean, I, I would look for specifics about the pieces of it, you know. Okay. Like, this okay. interview blew my mind because right. blah, 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 you know, yeah. that kind of thing. Right. So, so to add to that, one thing, well, two, two things about that. Um, I agree, like, do it, do 10, but uh -huh. actually make it a higher price and include, like, uh, a one-on-one. -on -one mm. Oh, that's a good idea. Or interview. Mm. You know, charge a, actually charge a really high price, like $1,000 right. a ticket or something like that, right. and then just make it 10, and then have, like, or maybe you do, like, a couple mastermind sessions, like a mastermind group or right. something like that. Um, where you're gonna, you know, do some kind of additional coaching, or you're gonna give them something. Just come up with a few things uh, of your personal time, mm -hmm. so that, and then you'll be able to actually uh, talk to them, right? Um, right. And, yeah. and that it'll create that exclusivity. It'll also create an anchoring point for when you actually do the launch, and then your price is much lower than the thousand dollar or whatever you charge right. for for this. Um, and then, um, and then, and then, uh, as far as I, I like what Josh said about getting the testimonials. Um, if you can't get testimonials, though, so you could always take testimonials from your screencast in general. Yeah, yeah, so that's for, true. Yeah, for the first round, you know, but right. but yeah, but if you do something like that, I think that could I be. Should, if, if I do something like that, I should easily be able to get testimonials out of that. I can I can have Momoko whip up a small questionnaire to send out to the the ten people that that pay for that. Get them to to answer that questionnaire and use that as the testimonials. Yeah. Mm -hmm. One other thing that I'm wondering is um, a lot of your work is kind of focused around JavaScript. Mm -hmm. So are you kind of targeting JavaScript developers or are you targeting developers in general that could use RabbitMQ? The screencasts are highly focused on JavaScript developers. The ebook and the interviews are very broad. So anyone out there is going to get benefit out of this. Even if you're not a JavaScript developer, picking up the screencast is still going to provide a lot of valuable information to you. Yeah. So well, I guess what I'm wondering is, are you going to focus your marketing toward JavaScript people, or are you going to somehow communicate to people that, you know, if you're in the wider programming community, this is valuable to you as well? Yes. <laughs> so, 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 yes, I am going to say, look, this, the, the screencasts here are focused on JavaScript, but, you know, like you just said, I will talk broadly about how it's, applicable to, to far more people than just the JavaScript community. Because the, the, the people that I'm, that I'm interviewing are, are doing Ruby and .NET mm -hmm. and Erlang and yeah. you know, all kinds of systems out there that, that people are, are coding in. So it's, it's not like the whole thing is just for JavaScript developers. I mean, I'm calling it RabbitMQ for developers, and yes, my screencasts are focused on JavaScript, but it's still... There's there's at least five episodes out of the twelve that will give any developer valuable information without touching JavaScript. It's mm -hmm. just going to show you RabbitMQ in general, right. and then the JavaScript specific episodes in, of the screencast are still going to provide high level overviews and implementation details mm -hmm. that you can then translate into your language with your driver. 
So, so you, yeah. okay. I, I'm just going to recommend if you're going to do this, um, I would set up two kind of parallel sales funnels because okay. I think you will con- I will I think you will convert much more highly in the job in the JavaScript community if right. you target them specifically. Right. Because this is right up their alley. It's all the stuff they need to know, and the examples are in a place where they can actually just go use them. Yeah. And then and then um, have another funnel for other development communities. So they can come in and it's like, look, this is about RabbitMQ. The examples are in JavaScript. Right. And then the people who want it, they can pick it up. But the people who are doing Node.js and are interested in learning about RabbitMQ, your voice you just know, went it, out, Jack. <laughs> <laughs> go figure. I'm in a hotel on hotel Wi-Fi, yeah. but... But, but yeah, yeah, no, I, 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 I totally yeah. get your point, and that's a that's an interesting idea. I might, I'll have to think about that because this is already a tremendous amount of work. Yeah. Uh, if it's if it's easy enough to do, then I'll I'll probably do it. But the 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 issue of having this focused on one specific language, it it might not be a huge issue anyways, because mm-hmm. the books that I have on RabbitMQ. Well, one of the yeah. books, the, the messaging pattern books that I have, Enterprise Integration Patterns, it's all Java. There's a little bit of .NET in there, but it's it's mostly well, Java. The JavaScript and Java are pretty much yeah, the same totally. thing. Yeah, totally. Just like ham That's and right. hamster. <laughs> no, five letters difference. <laughs> Wait a minute. Are you telling me that ham isn't made out of hamster? <laughs> <laughs> so so the, the RabbitMQ in action book that I have, it's all Python. I don't do Python. Hmm. But yeah. it's it's a really good book. It's got a tr- ton of tremendous value, and I read the Python code and I understand what's going on, even though I don't mm-hmm. write Python. So you know the it, it's so I, I I get your point. Um, I'm definitely gonna have to think about that. I will see what it will take to put two sales funnels together, one for language agnostic and one just for JavaScript. I don't know if I want to take the time to do that this time around. Yeah. I think well, really, I like... really, what I'm thinking is just put up uh, two landing pages. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I like the idea. I think the I... trouble will be just be um, segmenting. Yeah. Like if you can't yeah. segment your own list, and if you if you had right. if your list was segmented, then that's one thing. But it's not. If you've got like if you've got traffic coming in from sources where you know, you know, like say you did like a JavaScript oh. weekly ad. Or right. Something. You know, okay. You know, all those people are going to be JavaScript, and then you do you do one in the like the Ruby, yeah. Ruby Weekly. You know that 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 would make sense. Right. If you can segment the traffic like that. Yeah. One thing you could do also is you know as you maybe not at a launch, but it, as you start to get some feedback and you start to get some metrics here, is uh, instead of having all the videos be in different languages, but you could just have like a getting started video for right. each of the major languages that just shows how oh, you yeah. that up. Because the thing is, like, I, I use RabbitMQ for .NET, right. and I haven't used the JavaScript version. I haven't watched mm-hmm. the videos. But I would assume that um, once I'm I'm set up, that a lot of the same fu- – I could just translate it directly, yeah. right? It's like, it's yeah, like right. when I did iOS uh, development in Xamarin, I could just say, okay, well – Bam! You know, here's the right. here's what Objective C right. code. I can translate that to C sharp, but it's the same libraries and same you know type of thing. Right. So if you get people started, if you're like, yeah. well, here here this first video shows you how to use RabbitMQ with Ruby, and it's like now the rest of these videos are all in JavaScript. But since you're already started, you're basically just going to take the same thing and just translate the Java syntax, the JavaScript syntax, right to Ruby, and you're good to go. Um, that might be a helpful thing, and it probably would be pretty easy for you to, you know, create the intro videos in in, uh, in so, different languages. I have a, I have a question, um, Chuck. How much would it cost for you to record that intro and in, to Ruby <laughs> for me? <laughs> <laughs> I'm, and I'm I'm deadly serious here. If I could get other it. if I could get other language developers to record an intro. You know, in, intro to using RabbitMQ in that language, and include that as part of this bundle as well. I mean, there is instant access to a new world of uh, mm-hmm. of, of people that would buy it. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. especially if Chuck, if you could somehow tie in Chuck's. Yeah, totally, to, totally right? give the opportunity to to tie in Rails clips. Mm-hmm. And and advertise that too. Oh, that could to be really audience. interesting. Yeah. Because I'm doing that with with the interviews. Like I just recorded the the guy from Cloud AMQP. 
I spent like mm -hmm. five minutes at the beginning of that interview just gushing over how awesome Cloud AMQP is. And we talked right. about how, how his service works a number of times yeah. in the interview, and I gave him direct opportunity at the very end of the episode to just do a, a full-on sales pitch. Mm -hmm. So I mean, we, we can totally set up the same kind of same kind of deal to get an intro to RabbitMQ with Ruby. Uh, I could probably find somebody in the Python community to do it. Actually, if I can get the interview with one of the book authors that I want, he's the guy that wrote the Python library for the RabbitMQ. So I could possibly mm -hmm. talk him into doing that. You know, I can, and I know some .NET people that I could get for the .NET side of things as well. Yep. So here's more opportunity to make this thing ten times more awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and the other thing is is that you can, I mean, if you don't get it done by your launch date, you know, if it comes out a week later, I don't think that's going to hurt you at all. Right? Yeah, because that's just another, gives me... It's another opportunity to promote it. Right. It gives me another, another mini launch. Look, new content. This is awesome. Yep. And start targeting the additional... Additional, additional language communities, right. yeah. Exactly. Oh, excitement. <laughs> I am, I'm like, I've had too much caffeine this morning. I've already done one interview for this. I've been working on video, and now I'm, like, all excited about the opportunities here, and I'm, like, jumping up and down in my seat. <laughs> I'm, like a, I'm like, a, like a 10 year old kid on sugar and caffeine. Derek, this is interesting to me too to watch this because, um, you know, like sometimes you've ha found it hard to be, stay motivated with the screencasting. Yeah. And there's something about this though that's different, and I don't know if it's the writing component or if it's the social component or what. But try to bottle that up. Figure, figure out that's what that is. Point. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and then try to bring that into Watch Me Code to help keep you, you know, when you're when you're feeling lack of motivation. Yeah, I, I think I think a, a lot of the problem that I have with Watch Me Code is just the monotony of just doing screencasts over and over and over again. Yeah. And since I started putting together these series, because before, be, prior to like October, November last year, everything that I was doing was just whatever I felt like doing that week. And it was, it mm. was kind of, it was difficult for me to just pick something and go and do yeah. it. And since I, since I started the, I guess it was the Mongoose series that really started as the first real series that I, that I explicitly planned. Since I started doing that, I found it easier to sit down and plan episodes and get things done. I'm still... It's, it's still kind of burning out on producing the episodes, but I've taken... I, I took last week and recorded six, five or six episodes that were only like five or ten minutes each. Yeah, and so mm -hmm. I've given myself a couple of months, well, about a month and a half of of room to not record episodes and to focus on all this other stuff, the marketing and the ebook and the interviews, and and I think giving myself that space to do something other than trudging through screencast yeah. recording every week yeah. is is helping a lot. It's similar to what John's been doing with his videos. Yeah, yeah, very kind much. Of yeah. yeah, it helps too just to have that those constraints and then like the mental at, like process of thinking about a topic. Right. If you stretch it over five or six uh, videos, then you it's yeah. just, I mean the mental load is really is really in coming up with the idea. And so if you can make an idea yeah. last you five or six episodes, that makes a lot of a lot of sense. So. Yeah. So yeah, the the yeah. five episodes that I recorded last week were JavaScript arrays, iterating through arrays. That was yeah. it, and it, that was five episodes. Mm -hmm. There's, there's you know an, another ten episodes that I I could record just on arrays and still have a lot of value in those episodes. Yeah. yeah. And so I'm, I'm thinking I'm probably gonna go do another short series sh series of short episodes like that, but not on arrays. I don't want to do like 20 episodes in a row. Just <laughs> <laughs> but I could, I could go to another brief subject in JavaScript for five episodes and then, you know, if two or three series down the road come back to arrays and do mm -hmm. more with arrays. And yeah. So there, could you there's do lots a, of opportunity. Have, do you have a, a video series on this already? Yes. 
It's okay. it's actually one giant episode that really should be a series. It's mm. it's a it's a forty five minute episode. It's it's like episode three or four or something like that. It's it's forty five minutes long, and it it should be broken down into five separate episodes. I, I may actually go back and do that. That could be because you've already got the book. That could be another bundle there. If you're... Right, right. Well, the, the yeah. book came from the from the episode. I I just took. Uh, the same examples and, and same I, same information that, as the episode, and and wrote the the book slash email course for JavaScript. This. What's your uh, subscriber count now? Um, it's gone down a little. It's down to three sixty six, which has been frustrating. Um, it was at three seventy two for a while, and and slowly gone down. Um, on that note, though, I do have Momoko. Working fast and furious on some site design updates, and she sent me some mock layouts for this, and it's it's looking brilliant. She's doing some really good stuff. Um, she's also put Optimizely in place on the homepage, and has uh, taken out a couple of things and changed up a couple of things. And we're seeing some pretty good results from those changes that she's made already. So once we get the full optimized homepage in place, I'm, and and the full onboarding process, which is going to change the the subscription sign up page and process as well, I think this is going to do a lot to to get people through the funnel and get them into subscriptions. Nice. Nice. Have you changed much? I'm looking at the page now. I haven't looked at it in a while. Have you changed much? Um, she started the, working on it? The home page has become shorter. It used to list current episodes, free episodes, Q&A episodes, and bundles. And now it's only listing bundles before it gets into some of the about the site info down below. So it's it's basically just shorter, less information. And all of that other stuff has gone up into the episodes menu. Above. Okay. Okay. Mm-hmm. But that's about it. The, other than that, I haven't changed much on the site design or site at all in a while. Cool. Okay. okay. That's about it for me. I've got a ton of things to think about and do on this still. So, how's the baby, Josh? Oh, he's doing great. <laughs> he, um, I'm still on my uh, kind of paternity leave here, and uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'll be going back to work on Monday. Uh, but yeah, yesterday we got this we got this baby carrier thing that looked like the strap on your front kind of deal. Oh yeah, and, uh, the Ergo so, baby carriers. Yep. Oh yeah. Yep. We got the Ergo one. It's I really nice. It's like two hundred so nice. bucks. Yeah, but, but they're totally worth it. Yeah, it's totally worth it. It's like something that you would take hiking. You know? Yeah. Like, <laughs> and, and there's really. there's like four different positions you can put the baby in to to make the 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 parent comfortable as well as make the baby comfortable. I used to do, I, I did the, the front carry and the back carry. My wife would do the back carry and the side carry. So we, we loved that Ergo baby carrier. It was really nice. Yeah, we had a yeah. cheap one before that would cost like 20 bucks. Right. And it was definitely, felt like it cost 20 bucks. It was, the the it was, Ergo carrier and the baby Bjorn, if you want the, the more traditional baby holster. Okay. <laughs> baby holster. Yeah. Baby. <laughs> baby. Baby. Bam. <laughs> um, yeah, so... I do this then, too. Flip around. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> That's the danger side. Yeah. Uh, hey, guys, I'm going to take off. I've got to uh, pack up and get ready to go to the airport, so... All right. All right, yo. See ya. See you, Chad. I'll see you all next week. See ya. Uh, yeah, but he's been he's been pretty good. He's been uh, he's been sleeping relatively well. We had a kind of a rough night last night. He was yeah. a lot, but other other than that, he's been sleeping several hours at a time through the night. So getting you know getting a little bit of rest and nice. um, yeah, and I've been I've been kind of taking him in the afternoon a little bit right. and and well letting Lisa nap with the other two. Yeah. So always good. Yeah, yeah. So, but yeah, and this my, is my wife and I tended to trade off one at a time. You know, as the baby wakes up at night, we'll just switch who wakes up to to take care of the baby, and did the same thing throughout the day. And it helped a lot being able to actually get both parents a little bit of sleep now and then. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, but I'm I'm having I'm actually having a pretty good week here. I got um kind of I'm trying to get I got back a little bit into my routine. 
this nice. week and started just doing working on some copywriting stuff in the morning mostly and then taking the afternoon off so it's been more relaxed pace but yeah it's I'm pretty energized because I feel like everything's really starting to click together for me here like mm -hmm. everything's I'm starting to feel like everything's pulling in the same direction which is really really great um, yes. I don't feel like I'm getting pulled in multiple directions anymore um, so I got um, I've been working this week I was working on my my website so I, I kinda just rewrote like I basically my website before was kind of promoted my blog and I was really kind of going for the info marketing thing and I've completely I'm, I've kinda I tore a lot of that down and I've kinda made it into a copywriter website um, nice. so the home page is kinda like basically just like a pitch for my services and um, I've got like I went through all my archives and found like some some uh, samples of my work that I could put up there as like a portfolio uh, put up a list of clients and uh, companies that I've worked with nice um, yeah so it took down all my pop-ups and everything so I'm for now I'm going to I'm, I'm still not really sure like long-term what who I'm gonna who I really wanna pursue as a market but for right now I'm definitely focusing on B2B and going after the software company thing like that's been working out really really well nice. um, so everything that I'm that I'm doing right now is kinda targeting that market but I think I'm gonna get it seems like I'm, I'm, I'm still getting a lot of opportunities for like um, B2C like um, actually today I just got an email from uh, Ben Settle somebody that he knows is working on putting together like a little agency and mm. he recommended me as one of the people that she could bring in. Nice. Uh, nice. So yeah, yeah. So that's been pretty cool. Um, so I don't know. I don't know how that's going to pan out yet. Right. But um, just make sure that if you do any kind of deal like this, that you have ownership. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's my yeah. main main thing. Like, do not like sign on as uh, you know. You just make sure you have some ownership. Yeah. That's I want to have. Yeah. What I really want is I want to have some control. Like, I don't want to be like. I don't want to say, okay, you know, I'll take like basically take a salary, right? Or right. Like, yeah. Right. You know, and just take whatever they get, whatever they shovel my way. Like, yeah. I want to, I want to be able to be able to pick and choose and have control and, you know, and I want to see some pretty decent income from it if I'm going to do anything yeah. like this. So, yeah. but yeah, so it would be nice. It would be like basically she'd be doing the client acquisition stuff, and I would just be, I would just be doing the writing. So that would cuts the overhead down. Oh, nice. nice. That'd be awesome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sweet. It's finding yeah, it's, clients. I mean, that's a full-time job in itself. Yeah. Yeah. I, so I've got. Um. That's the other. So, so that's the other thing that's been been clicking this week too. Is um, I feel like I finally have, kind of have my system in place. I know how this is going to work. Um, I uh, actually finding so so um, I'm I realized, uh, I took this really good training course a couple weeks ago. About email prospecting, mm -hmm. and one of the one of the concepts in there was this idea of a trigger event, where you look for n like news events that happen with companies, and you ah. use that as like your foot in the door. You mm -hmm. know, like they get a, a big round of funding. Well, guess what? Now they're probably going to be increasing their marketing budget, so they're going to mm -hmm. be looking for. You know, so, so you kind of just you you let them know that you're thinking about their company, as and that kind of warms them up, and then you can just say, you know, like this is what I do, and would it make sense for us to connect? So it's like a real soft, just kind of start the dialogue type of thing. So right. I realized this week that um, I had a pretty good trigger event happen um, where uh, we have sp my podcast sponsors. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. So that's like, that's like okay, you're kind of already paying money to endorse me, right? Uh -huh. way. So um, I went to, I'm going to everybody that was part of that um the bundle, the app bundle that we advertised a few weeks ago. Oh, nice! Those are all developer tool, all, yep. all developer tool type of type of vendors. Right. And so I'm trying to trying to get. Uh, I've I've nice. made contact with several of them. Um. And yeah. So I've got. I real. This is what I mean. Like everything kind of pulling together is like we've got this podcast and. Right. You know, I want to write for companies that put together developer tools, and we've got people sponsoring us that offer that type of product. You know, so it's like. Everything's kind of coming together in a really right. nice way, and you know they spend money on advertising. And yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. So, so nice. yeah, so I've got a couple, and and um, I've got I'm really happy with Contactually, uh, my CRM. I got that all set up, and it's really nice. It's really really slick, and I've been using it to just make little reminders to follow up with people. Nice. Um, I was using like Boomerang or um, 
just I have this other the other app that I use to email me reminders, mm -hmm. and um, it's it, it works. But this way you can have everything kind of like in one place, and yeah. you can see what's when stuff's coming up, and um, so it's it's pretty cool. Like you, what I've done is that you can actually has these buckets, and you can put clients. So like when I when I first find out about somebody that I'm interested in contacting, I throw them into like a prospects bucket, mm -hmm. and nothing really happens at that point. I don't want to get nagged to rem to like stay in touch with them because I've never even contacted them. Um, and then you can put them into like a workflow. Basically, you say, okay, I want to work with, I want to try to get get this person's attention now. So you put them into this workflow, and it'll make reminders for you like, oh, you know, you emailed this person, but they never responded. Because right. it hooks into your email, and it know like it 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 hooks into my Gmail account, so it knows they never responded. So then it'll you know nag me like, okay, you need to follow up now, uh, and then after a certain amount of time, I can just have them fall off into like a you know, fall off into into a bucket where like I don't want to really get nagged about them anymore because they're not going to respond. So you can do some automation with it. Uh, you know, we don't. I'm not going to like automate emails obviously because it's not like an autoresponder, but right. Um, yeah, so, um, but yeah, having this idea in my head of like these tr trigger events is making it really easy to spot opportunities, and I have a list of like, gosh, like 50 companies that I want to target, you know, already, <laughs> and I, you know, like, there's so many, there's, and I'm realizing that a lot of these companies have parent companies, so like, right. you know, I'm, I, um, uh, I, I reached out to, um, I think it was, uh, I forget I forget the name of the company, but one of the companies turned out to be owned by uh, run, by the same company that owns Runscape or Runscope rather. So you know, so a lot of these there, there's like the companies that are basically spin-offs of mm -hmm. the parent companies. And so if you can get into one of the smaller ones, then you can get you can you know work on getting into the parent company, and they've got you know 30 different tools that they build, mm -hmm. uh, and they all need to be all need to be marketed. So. Yeah, so that's been that's been a lot of fun. I um, so I worked on my website. I submitted my uh, AdWords appeal. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Now that I'm so what I did was I tore down my old ads that I had been running, and just put up like a very simple like it's just one ad. It's like this B two B copywriter basically, right. and um, it's like really vanilla, and it just goes to my homepage. And I and then I submit the appeal and said like I revamped my entire website. Here's all the things I did. Yeah. And would you please, you know, take take another look at this? So mm -hmm. I'm going to call them. I may, mainly just want to get my address cleared because um, <laughs> right? they, they blacklist your address and your credit card. Like I can't. I, it's not like you can just create a, another account. They, I don't. I don't understand. Aggressive. My AdWords uh, like has been rejected like 15 times now. Okay. But You're, I'm not banned. It just they just reject my ad because the landing page was was yeah. Bad it, or like, it, it really just depends. It really depends. <clears throat> excuse me. It's really arbitrary. It's really really arbitrary. Okay. Like, what a, yeah. Whoever's looking at it and you know whatever automated process. Some of it might be automated. Um, well, so the, the guy that's doing my stuff, he's working mm -hmm. directly with with someone from Google. Yeah, I guess, and then and that's how this is going. And so he's like, "Oh, they said we need to make these changes, so he's making these changes." And then okay, so I mean, we'll see how it works out. Like, I don't have a hundred percent confidence in this, but <laughs> but I mean, he's getting more progress than 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 it. I mean, he must have some kind of direct connection there because yeah, it's uh, like I didn't think that they gave you feedback and said that this is what you need to change on your page. Yeah. But, yeah, I think they'll be okay with if if they'll look at it honestly. If they'll honestly look at it, I think they'll be okay with it as it is now. Because before it was like you know I was I was it was pretty it was pretty easy to infer that I was doing some type of affiliate thing. There yeah. was nothing in, on my website that said here's how I make money like that made it clear like here's what my business is. Oh, I see. Yeah. And now it's like I'm presenting myself as a copywriter. So you know like there's a business there. There's a service that I'm providing. I'm not just sending people to a, an offer, yeah, right, from, for somebody else's product. So, if if I can get a human being to look at it, I I feel pretty good that I'll probably be able to get it reinstated. Yeah, if 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 if, 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 if. <laughs> getting that human. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So and I I redid my uh, I'm I'm reworking my LinkedIn account as well. Like I've I um basically I'm I've gone through. I'd kind of when I had it, it was for more of like a software developer type position, 
I never had updated it. So I've gone back through, I'm going back through all of my old jobs and splitting out. So one thing, um, with LinkedIn, it's very keyword based. So yep. you can split out. It's like basically like what Google was like, like 10 years ago before, before they got into like a lot of the more sophisticated stuff they do now. But, um, so, you know, the more keywords you can get into your, into your profile, the better off you are. And so I've gone through all, all my old jobs and like I'm splitting out, I'm actually taking positions and splitting them up into multiple like job descriptions. Mm -hmm. So I can have headlines that match what I was actually doing versus just like whatever generic title HR gave me. Right, yeah. Um, so I'm, yeah, I'm just kind of slowly working through that and I, I've, got, I've done a lot of stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually pretty amazing. Like when I go back through, I, I keep going back through. Like, and I'm like digging through my old archives, looking for samples. I'm like, oh yeah, I did that. Like I forgot, I completely forgot, but I taught a college course on feature writing. <laughs> so I oh, put nice. that in there, you know, nice. like yeah, and I it, it went really well, and I got you know great feedback from the students, and um, I completely forgot about that, you know. <laughs> so I put that in there now. Like I listed that. Like I'm a writing, you know, feature writing instructor. Right. Um. You know, and like I, I, yeah, it's just amazing. It's amazing when you actually go back at what you've done, and look at it, and dig into it, right? And and you do it from like I'm doing it from a fresh per fresh perspective. Like, okay, I want to, what can I pull out of this that that makes me look um, like a better copywriter? You know, and so I'm trying to c approach it from the audience's perspective. Um. So yeah, so been spending a lot of time. I'd like to take a moment to thank our sponsor, DigitalOcean, for helping to sponsor the Entree Programmers to make sure that our show keeps up and running the way that you out there in our audience wants to hear it. DigitalOcean is an amazing company, quite honestly. They have an SSD-only cloud infrastructure on which you can build Linux VPS servers for as little as five bucks a month. It's ridiculously cheap to get an amazingly powerful and incredibly fast server. Head over to DigitalOcean.com and you can get a Linux box running with Ubuntu or Core OS or any of a number of other different Linux variations in less than a minute. It's incredibly easy to get one of these machines up and running, and they serve more than 400,000 developers, including the Entree programmers, with their services every day, day in and day out. And I personally run several websites with them. We have the entreprogrammers.com, of course, but then I also have a lot of my own websites running up there, including all of Watch Me Code, DerekBailey.com, and the Signal Leaf blog. I use DigitalOcean every day, and they're amazing. They serve all of my viewers and listeners through a terabyte of bandwidth every month for five bucks a month. It's incredible how much bandwidth they give you for that much money. And it doesn't stop there either. You can go far beyond just five bucks a month into some highly scalable, very advanced, and extremely powerful servers with far more bandwidth than you're ever going to need, and a lot of processing power, memory, and storage space as well. So head over to DigitalOcean.com and sign up today and get started with a $10 credit, giving you two free months of service for those $5 machines that they offer. Just use the promo code ENTREEPROGRAMMERS and you'll get your $10 credit with DigitalOcean.com. So be sure to check them out and be sure to say thank you for sponsoring the Entree Programmers podcast. Hey, John Sanmez here. Just thought I would take a moment to thank one of the sponsors for this week's episode of Entre Programmers, Raygun.io. Really thank Raygun.io for sponsoring this podcast. And if you don't know what Raygun.io is, I definitely recommend that you check it out. If you've ever been in the situation where you're trying to get all of these user error messages and logs and stack traces from your application out of some log file and then try to sort it all out, maybe you dump that into a SQL database or something like that, you need raygun.io. It, it just makes things simple. What it basically does is it lets you find and fix bugs before the users even encounter them. So you can see your stack traces, you can see that no pointer exception or that, uh, that exception that got thrown before a user happens to see it. And it's all in one big dashboard where you can just group things and, and check them off as you fix them. And you can even communicate with users right from there. So it, it's gonna save you time and money you know developer time is expensive you don't want to be wasting that going through log files and trying to come up with your own homegrown solutions it, it integrates error reporting and monitoring into your development workflow so you can have assurance that your er, your releases are error free and it has full stack monitoring lets you monitor errors across your entire application it supports all languages and platforms yes that's right 
all languages and platforms. So whether it's a Node.js backend or JavaScript front end, you've, you've got it all in one place. So check out Raygun.io and thanks again to Raygun.io for sponsoring this week's episode of Entreprogrammers. Plunking away at some copywriting for my mentor. Nice. But yeah, actually, uh, the one thing I've been working on this week, Derek, was um, kind of got me thinking about uh, when we were talking about your mm -hmm. doing those different videos, because um, what I've been doing is I there's this um, my, my my mentor has a client who is uh, selling a product for diabetics, right. and there's like a bunch of different reasons why you might need this product as a diabetic, and it's different for every person. So what we're actually right. doing is building a funnel. Um, it's actually Ryan Levesque's um, strategy where. Uh, you've got a funnel, you got like a landing page with a video and it says like, take my quiz. So there's this, you take this short like five question quiz and then they, you put people into different buckets. Hmm. And huh. you collect like, yeah. okay, you know their, their gender, you know their age, you know, you know a few, couple things about their symptoms and then you can tell them, okay, well this is, this is probably what's going on for you and you can customize it. So right. we have these 11 different videos and um, basically what I've been doing is rewriting like about 40%. So there's a bunch of static content that's kind of like the top and the bottom. Like the close mm -hmm. is the same, the intro is the same. And then the part where we talk about what's going on with their, them is different for depending on how they respond to that survey. Right. So so that's been just a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, that sounds interesting. It's a, it's a lot of work. It's funny, it's like my mentor was like, um, he, when, he needed to do some rewrites on part of it this week, and um, he 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 got into it, and he's like, he's like, I was just gonna go do these myself, and then I was like, oh, this is a lot of work. This is taking a long time. <laughs> you, know, you do it. <laughs> I was like, oh man, because there's eleven of them. Like making, yeah. making like yeah. small changes to each one takes right. like you know five hours. It's like editing a book. Jeez, I yeah. hate editing. Yeah, well, it's editing 11 different versions of a book. Yeah, oh, geez. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, it's like there's like 11, yeah, there's like 11 different, you know, slight variations of it, and you have to go uh -huh. through and make sure you're not, you're not crushing anything or anything, so. <laughs> yeah, that would be, that's work that I'm not good at. I yeah, yeah, I yeah. totally would have sent that to my unpaid intern. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so that's pretty much it. I guess um, the other thing is uh, Wes... Wes just arbitrarily, Wes Boss, um, just on his own decided to do a sale this week um, on the Sublime stuff. Okay. So just like on on Thursday morning, he like pings me. He's like, well, the email's in drip, and um, I'm doing a sale. I was like, okay, whatever. And he's like, I want to do a follow-up email tomorrow. So I was like, okay, whatever. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so it's, it's right. yeah, it's going really well. And, um, nice. Yeah, he's, he, he's sold at least at least 50 copies at this point of his book. So nice. and we're going to sp split that up according to our uh, affiliate arrangement. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I'm actually kind of thinking, I don't know, I'm starting to get the, the sublime itch a little bit again and thinking, <laughs> yeah. thinking that I want to try at some point in the near future, I want to try like doing a very tiny little product, like a, some kind of little short guide or something like a five-pager type yeah. of thing. Yeah. And relaunching it, you know, launching it, and um, you know, seeing if I could generate a few thousand bucks doing those, then that would be, that would be really nice. Yeah, and if you can put throw a system around it, right? I mean, even like what you got going with Wes is right. sort of right, so mm -hmm. that you can like, if you can get just get enough into that to to be able to build a system that generates money, and then you can kind of step away from it, right? It's like then right. then that investment that you've made so far isn't mm -hmm. a waste. Uh, and and it, and it does seem like you're kind of close to that. Like there, you yeah. should be able to, even if it doesn't generate you a huge amount of money every month, but if it generates you some kind of steady money income, then you don't have to invest time right. or effort into it. Then it's it's worth it. But you got to yeah. get to that point where it's like, you know, I'm yeah. I'm focusing so much on systems lately because that's yeah. what I'm realizing is <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it, and um, the other thing I need to do is get uh, the advertising because I've gotten I, I had a guy who advertised with me like two weeks ago, and he was launching, they're launching like a mobile development toolkit basically in JavaScript type of deal, like kind of like G, uh, jQuery UI mm -hmm. or something like that, um, or the Tel Telerik tools. Um, right. And uh, so he, he bought just, he bought an ad, 
and they got a bunch of good traffic out of it. Got like he was really happy. They got like two thousand visits to their new site, and they had just they just launched this thing. Um, so we're gonna do another ad. So I really need to get like an advertiser kit put together to make that easier and start to collect testimonials from people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, because I have had some pretty good success. I mean, we had, we had John's thing. We had, um, you know, I had this. I've had this guy. I've had a couple others that went pretty well. So I need to start collecting those and and promoting that. Because like right now, people are finding me. Just I don't. I think this guy contacted me through my form on my website, like my yeah. contact me form. So if I make it a little easier for people. There's um there's a couple of services too that do the newsletter. Yeah, I've looked at I've looked at one or two of those and they don't pay very much. It's like I might make like five hundred dollars a month off of it if yeah. I'm lucky. Because they what they like the one I'm uh, so I'm involved with buy sell ads, mm -hmm. and I'm using them for like uh, a couple of different things for filling like extra space on Simple Programmer, and I'm also have them on my newsletter, uh, and then. What I'm finding with it is like, I don't know. I mean, they had a few different products. Like, they don't have it all under one umbrella, but, but, but they allow you to advertise like a, a CPM rate for your, you know. Okay. And so, so, so it's not just like you're just like showing display ads that are rotated or whatever. Um, they they have that as like a backfill, but mm -hmm. they also have the ability for someone to just buy you out so mm -hmm. and then they take a cut of like 15 or 20 percent I don't remember you know it's somewhere around there but anyway so you so you price it and then you know let's say that you price advertising in your newsletter for like you know a thousand dollars or you know fifteen hundred dollars a month for your list and then you, they might sell it for you and then and then you get to keep you know 80 percent of that yeah mm -hmm. yeah if I could get people at that rate that would probably be worth it uh, right, like right now, I'm charging five hundred dollars per issue. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. And that's for like a hundred word, like a max hundred word slot with an image. So. Yeah, I think you could probably. I don't know. You might look at it because then it's an automated way of. You might not make as much money, but if you don't have to yeah. manage any of this stuff and they're right, just, you're just putting a code into your newsletter. Like I've got mine set up with Drip right now. I don't have anyone that's actually sponsoring it, so it's just putting in like a default ad. Uh, but I okay. still make some money off of it. But I believe if someone buys it out, then just that code that's in my Drip, you know, RSS would would just go automatically mm -hmm. into. To whatever the fill is, like that's what I'm doing on my website on Simple Programmer. I just have <clears throat> a, a spot where I've put in their code, and then you know someone has bought the space. Like this company, uh, actually, are they there now? Um, uh, at one time, I had a, a company that had bought one of the spaces, and they were, you know, it just their ad was automatically showing up. So nice. Yeah, I should look into that just to see if it would be worth it. Yeah, yeah. So I, I was kind of leaning. I was like, you know, as 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 opposed to the idea. But then I was like, well, wait a minute, you know, because because I was opposed to the idea. Because I was like, well, I could go and get a higher price if I go and find people. But mm -hmm. I was like, well, but I'm not going and finding people. Right. And that's the thing is. <laughs> yeah. And right. then there's overhead involved in negotiating and talking yeah. with them and dealing with any issues. Right. Like, if someone else, like, I'd rather take. I might as well be filling this space and making some money. So I mean, it ended right. up. End up making me a couple hundred extra dollars a month, so yeah, Thanks. or doing nothing. So right. yeah, I, I'm um I'm a little torn because like if, when I do ads, it takes away from the 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 traffic we get to Wes's book. Yeah, yeah. So we kind of have like I kind of have like I consider him to be like my permanent sponsor. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then whenever we don't have an ad, which we only have an ad maybe like once a month or so, and uh, so uh, any other time we're like you know, I'm making anywhere from four or five hundred bucks a month off of his stuff. So mm -hmm. if I yeah, if I don't um, gosh, my headset keeps dying. What in the world is going on? <laughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. So I don't know. It would have to be it would have to be better than that for it to be worth worth my time. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Okay. Trying to charge that. Um, there was one other thing I wanted to talk about, and I can't remember what it is now. Yeah, blanking. Okay. So John. 
Uh, let's see. I was trying to sort of take off uh, since I got back from microconf, and then I went directly into my daughter's birthday into mm -hmm. Disney World, and uh, <laughs> uh, so it was actually. I, I've I've stayed on the one meal a day, but I was eating some pretty bad meals for like <laughs> and not, not hitting the gym. Yeah. So I took this week from the gym, uh, and next week I'll be back into my kind of regular routine. Uh, but um, I also tried to cut out. So I, this week, I pretty much my work I've been doing is meetings. So I, I record like four or five episodes of Get Up and Code. I've got like a couple more that are going to be recorded on Monday. So I'm going to have like a nice. Nice backlog of episodes. Oh, nice. Recorded one with Derek about the yep. the, new, the new religion I'm starting on one of those <laughs> $500 a month fee religion. Yeah. And now people are emailing me. They're like, I'm, I'm, I'm eating one meal a day. I'm like, nice. okay, good. This is good. Here comes the book, The Diet. You need a badge. Oh, yeah. You need a badge they can put on their website. Totally. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see. So, is, yeah. Is so one I meal did. Is com available? I did. A, I recorded some podcasts too. Uh, I keep on. I'm supposed to record with Brendan Dunn on his podcast, but now he had another issue come up. It getting uh, getting getting scheduled with that guy is very difficult. So <laughs> um, I, I tried for like a month and a half to get an interview with Scott Hanselman when I was working uh, for Telerik, and I mean every week, two or three days a week, we would schedule. I yeah. would show up on Skype, and he would say, "Sorry, this came up. Have to do it later." Yeah. For like a month or a month and a half, it was so ridiculous. I finally just said, "Look, I've I've wasted too much time on this. It's not worth it anymore." Yeah. Uh, actually, with um, I I I just I sent out emails to Scott and Bob Martin because I was like, "What's the most effective way? Like, if I just had to pick the most effective way I could market soft skills with the least amount of effort, right. I was like, to have them do blog posts." Well, totally. So I asked Scott and 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 Bob. I haven't heard back from Bob, but Scott said. I'm preparing for build, so it goes to the bottom of my list. Right. Uh, but that's, you know, if he eventually does that, like I'll eventually follow up again with him, but I think yeah. he will write one. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, which would, would be extremely effective in selling selling the book. Uh, i got to follow up with Bob again, but... Yeah, I I'm hoping to get pairs. people that I'm interviewing to, to do some marketing for me as well. I'm, I'm going to be sending all of them the complete package, of course. So yeah. hopefully hopefully they'll I'll, I'll get some, some good mileage out of... The additional audiences. Uh, let's see. I'm also talking with this guy this week. Or I talk, um, uh, who, who I who I got exposed to. Actually, he's the guy that got um, Keith uh, Perhack on our on Entreprogrammers. Okay. Um, he he's got a really interesting uh, idea. His business. It's it's like um, it's a productized service. It uh, it's his website is double your uh, audience. Dot com, I believe. Okay. Let's see if that's the one. Uh, really interesting idea. So what he does is um, he goes. Uh, his name is Kai, and he goes out and he gets some free advertising, I guess. So <laughs> um, <laughs> he 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 goes and he does uh, outbound marketing for you, like re reaching out to to people on your behalf. So okay. So like for example, what he might do for simple program. I'm still in talks with him, but but essentially he might go out and say. What are all the podcasts that John John could be on? Let me let me email them and and try to set up you know you know appointments with them and and get John on these podcasts. So he's doing one podcast a week, mm -hmm. right? You know, or, or what are all the blogs that John could be guest posting on that have overlapping audiences? What are the JV opportunities where he could do a webinar with them? And can I get the webinar set up so I just tell John just be here at this time? Oh, that's mm -hmm. great. So yeah, so these are huge, valuable. Like, you know, where can where can the book be marketed? Uh, you know, I could probably ask him to find me conferences that I could speak at, uh, to find you know anything to kind of you know find overlapping audiences where I can connect. Um, it, it, kind of those time-consuming things. Whereas if you have someone dedicated to doing that, yeah, uh, that'd be. And then also when Pete when emails come in to me, I should be able to forward him my emails. You know, if someone wants to like connect with me or have me on their podcast, and let him schedule the whole thing and get it all. Yeah. Um. That's what he did with with Keith. It's basically, but, um, a PR agency, right? I mean, yeah. That's what a PR agency used to do for people. Mm -hmm. 
It's like outsourced PR, um, mm -hmm. except that he understands like the micropreneur space yeah. and this kind of online marketing slash software developer space. Mm -hmm. right. So, um, so we'll see. I've still got to work it out with him, but he's a really cool guy. Uh, really, and I think that this, you know, he, he's he's working with Brendan Dunn. He's working with Keith Perhack. Uh, right now, and so that's it, it's which is pretty great too because like how do I find out about him? Well, those guys right when I, when they when he contacts me because my audience you know uh, you know to, to to help them do outreach, then I'm like well you know who are you? What are you doing? And uh, so he's got a good you know every time he does this he'll be reaching yeah. more more, right. more clients. Nice. So yeah, so yeah. that was um in uh, that 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 seems like something that might be might be promising. But um but yeah, so uh, I'm I'm thinking about about that and then uh, and then I'm actually possibly going to be I'm going to be talking with Keith uh, Perhack again about possibly doing some of the marketing stuff and funnel see if I can nice. outsource some of that. I need to start spending more simple programmer money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, so that's I still what, rely too much on Watch Me Code for part of my income. I, I I can't spend I can't put all of it back into like I want to. That's that's yeah. definitely something that I want to do, but I I can't right now. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Oh, so I did that. Oh, I was on the my episode of Mick Method podcast uh, dropped uh, like a couple of days ago. I nice. saw the email. Yeah, so How'd that was. Go? I haven't I haven't had a chance to listen yet. Uh, you know, when I recorded it, I thought that it didn't go as well as I would have liked. But when I listened to it, I was like, "Wow, this is, either he edited it so I sound better, or <laughs> but it sounded good to me. I was I was very happy with. It. I felt like it was one of my strongest, you know, podcast showings. He, so. nice. he does do a really good job with the editing. Whoever does his editing for him, I'm sure he doesn't do it himself. But they, they really tighten that show up because it's only 30 minutes, and so they chop out. I mean. When you listen to it, like I've listened to most of the episodes, and you start to get the sense that okay, no one actually talks this fluidly. Right. <laughs> Clearly, yeah. he's cutting out all the ums and ahs, and they kind of clip it. You know, they cut out the silences and the pauses, and they clip it down and they, you know, compress it so it's it always sounds really tight and fluid from start to finish. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, so it's, I thought that went really well. Well, it'll be interesting to see what kind of things come from that, just because. Yeah. It's a different different audience, uh, but but yeah. So that was that was. Uh, it felt good to be able to hold my own on on that kind of podcast and not look like <laughs> an, like an idiot. So yeah. <laughs> uh, especially considering, I mean, it's kind of good company to be in with all the the people that he's oh, yeah. had on that podcast. Yeah, <laughs> he's had an amazing amount. The guests he's had on that show are amazing. He's literally had all, like virtually every living. Really, you know, every living superstar direct response person. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so we'll see. I think that that there will be some good things that will come from that, uh, and it just adds some credibility. Uh, and then, oh, and then I did the badge thing, so that went out. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty sweet. A bunch of people are putting the badge on there, and that and Andrew did that. My my uh, VA, he 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 designed that badge. Oh, nice. nice! So he's got some skill. He's he's yeah. pretty, like I was, I was happy with it. Like, um, so he's in the Philippines. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So so yeah. So we'll see what happens. I think with that badge, I made the badge link back to my blog post on the blogging course. Mm -hmm. Oh, good move. Uh, I thought about making it a pretty link, but um, but the problem with making it a pretty link is that I think Google, I think with the pretty link, it's like a 301 redirect or, mm -hmm. uh, so I think Google does not give you any juice for that. Uh, yes. That so, is. so I've, I've decided to make it a permit link instead. Uh, you know, even though the pretty link would give me more flexibility to redirect it to different places, uh, I'd rather get the Google juice on right. the, on the post. So I think you can, you could look at that in the pretty links. I think that there is a way to, well, I guess it's always a, it's always going to be a redirect. So Google be, will probably yeah. you know even if it's a permanent redirect because you can you can I think you can make it a permanent redirect mm -hmm. in Pretty Link in the software. Yeah, yeah. there's an option for that, but um, that there's yeah permanent redirect is is what you want to do if you are changing a URL. 
So if, if you decide later that you want to change where people are sent, you can take down that blog post and use Pretty Link to intercept that URL on your exactly. site and then do a permanent redirect to wherever, you, wherever it is that you want to send people to. Um, Google will ding you for a permanent redirect for a little while. It'll, it'll knock like 30% mm -hmm. off of your SEO juice while it rebuilds all of its caching and everything else. Yeah. That it does. But eventually it'll come back up once the world starts sending over to your new page. Yeah, but, um, but yeah, we'll see what happens. I mean, at the very least, it's going to be a lot of people that are putting that badge on there, and then it's just, I mean, it's growing. Pretty soon, I think the world's going to start taking notice of all these software development blogs that are showing up because <laughs> literally, yep. I, 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 like, uh, I, I probably have at least, at least 500 new software development blogs that have wow. come up from this course. Wow. Right? Uh, so, and some of those will eventually take off and do well, so that'll yeah. be, I, I, you know, it, I feel like I'm planting a lot of seeds right now that are going to be good. I've had over 3,000, like 3,500 people go through the blog. Wow. Course. So. That's incredible. And not everyone actually creates a blog, so I'm, sure, I'm right. a low estimate is 500 people created a blog, but it might even be more than right. that. So, um, and then the badge numbers are going to be smaller, of course, but still that'll mm -hmm. be, that'll be good. So, um, yeah, so that's what I've also been thinking a lot about uh, content as far as um, I think the next logical step for me is I've talked about this a little bit, but is hiring some writers. Um, mm -hmm. to, and, and what I might do is is get like. Um, well, I'll hire an editor. Well, hire a content manager. Because you can get people to write for you. Mm -hmm. I don't think that would be hard. Okay. Um, so, so you're saying an editor to to do what would they do? So basically, they would look for writers. Basically, what I was doing for SitePoint. Oh, they would look for writers. Look for writers. Well, I mean, you and and also field you know field make it make it very obvious that you're on the site that you're open for business. Uh -huh. People will start sending you pitches, and then this person's job would be to to look at the pitches, decide which ones would actually be a good fit for your blog, mm -hmm. and whether the person can execute on it. Um, and handle the interactions because that's very it's a lot of work to mm -hmm. do that. So yeah, I, I I think you'd be better because like if you hire writers, you're still going to need to hire you're still going to need somebody to manage them. So right. it would be better to work with one person consistently who's like your production manager versus like trying to have three or four really good freelance writers. Right. That's a good idea. Okay, so and then what do you think? So an editor at this point would be a part-time job. Yeah. Unless I hired out in the Philippines, but I probably want to hire this as someone a right. native English speaker. Right. Yeah, and and somebody like um, I mean, in this in this field, like, so you want to probably look for somebody who's got some journalism experience. Um, uh. And the pay rates they're going to be expecting are going to be like in the we'll say well under $50 an hour. <laughs> so like mm -hmm. yeah. 20 30 bucks an hour would probably get you somebody pretty good. Okay, journalists, yeah, are used to, journalists are used to write, writing for peanuts. And this person should be a writer as well. They should write a few posts as well, like at least once a month, I would assume. Yeah, you could either way. I mean, yeah, yeah, they certainly should be editing, you know, heavily at you you don't want them heavily editing the posts. They, and they could edit my posts too and prove freedom. They could. Yep. Okay, because that right now I'm outsourcing to my wife who like so it's like <laughs> oh another post oh how long is this thing? <laughs> like, <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, yeah. Okay, that's interesting. All right, I'm glad I, I I'm gonna do that. That that makes a lot of sense because then that person can round up writers for me yeah. and and I just pay them a part time you know, so many hours, and because what I'd like to do is I'd like to fill up, and 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 I could eventually get regular regular columnists or writers from that, from the people that end up doing mm -hmm. well and their posts end up doing well, because right. I'm 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 thinking that my next really growth step is to take Simple Programmer and make it more like an Engadget or Jezebel or you know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, one of those uh, blogs, um, and and have. Like my next goal would be to make it so that there's a blog post every single day on Simple Programmer, mm -hmm. um, and and I've got the different topics, you know, from the you know essentially 
if you look at software developers life manual in my soft skills book like those sections I could have people write in different you know uh, pieces so I don't have to have someone that that writes exactly you know the kind of things that I write but you know di different areas you know um, and so but but if I could do that I mean I I'm just thinking like from a scale perspective for for one it would I wouldn't have to write a blog post every week uh, you know, right. I, I could write blog posts more when I feel like I'm going to spend more time on the on the individual blog post. And then two, just from the content creation aspect, if I'm doing one blog post a week, uh, you know, I'm getting so much traffic from that. It takes a long time. At this point, with having like hundreds of blog posts on my blog, like the impact of one blog post is very small. Like it takes a right. long time to make an impact right. now. Um, but if I start producing seven blog posts a week, I'll start to see some like I could double the traffic to Simple Programmer in probably six months. Mm -hmm. So right, because I'll have I'll have two to three times as much content in that amount yep. of time. So yep. so that's that's kind of where I'm thinking about going, and then then I can make things a little bit a little bit bigger. Um, mm -hmm. and and then for me, con uh, re like I have a direct relationship between traffic and sales. So if I double the traffic of my blog, I double the income from the blog. Uh, so uh, have you seen that with the – well, for starters, how how has your Lifehacker bump panned out? Like, Has that been a permanent increase? It's, it's kind of hard to measure. I don't know because I've had a few hits since then, so I haven't okay. really baselined yeah. out again. Um, I know that that post is still getting – I still get like 16 to 17 direct referrals from Lifehacker every single day. Mm-hmm. So, um, like, I'm trying to – let me look at my traffic here and see if I can kind of – it's uh, – it, it, it is kind of hard to tell, like, where – you know, how much is the is the baseline going up. Yeah. Um, I, I haven't seen – when I look at the Webmaster Tools, it doesn't it doesn't show a huge you – know, Like a lot of link backs or – Well, it doesn't show a huge change in search traffic, like, queries. And, mm -hmm. you know. Okay. But if I look at like monthly traffic, although again this is kind of hard to tell from a baseline. Yeah. But like okay, January, um, I had 127,000 page views. Mm -hmm. In February, I had 263,000 page views. That was the life hacker month. Right. Mm -hmm. In March, I had 188,000 page views. Uh, in April, so far, I've had 131,000 page views. Okay. So. Yeah. So it does seem like a. There's been a bump there. Yeah, I mean, I'm definitely at a higher spot than, you know, like um, if I look at the summaries. Let me see if I can pull that up. That that that's kind of interesting. Like if you look at, I don't know if you guys look at the daily average, but I can see those. I I usually look at them like year over year, and mm -hmm. that it gives a good indication. But like for for March, I'm hitting like I hit like six thousand uh, daily average. Okay. Of, of page views per day in April, right. I'm I'm at about 5,500 right now per day. So, um, and when I compare it year over year, like April of last year, I was at 3,000 or 2,800. Wow. Nice. And now I'm at 5,500. Um, and then the year before it was 1,800, and the year before is 437. So it's right. it's pretty close to doubling every right. year. Right. I think one of the like one of the things that this will really give you is. Um, if you can get back to doing, if you can get someone else doing some more technical posts, mm -hmm. that that will really like the stuff that you're doing now. I don't think is probably getting a lot of organic search stuff. Like it's good for your right. business, but right. it's not getting you traffic because it's more, um, it's a so, it's soft skill stuff, and it's general enough that if somebody searches, they're going to find life hacker. They're not going to find you. You know what right. I mean? Um, so if you but if you can get people cranking out the technical content again, that stuff's going to do really well with search with search um, you know with, with searching because it's the keywords you're going to get a lot more long tail keywords that are relevant yeah. from that. Plus, I've got the Google Juice on Simple Programmer. Yeah. So anything that I post on Simple Programmer that does well goes up in the in the in the search yep. results. So yep. so that'll that'll help. Yeah, when I look at like. Um, you know the top posts and pages like what's still coming in that why comments are stupid 
that got 312 page views today. <laughs> I love that, that post. Nice. That was really good. I wasn't a hundred percent sure of the refactoring. Like I understood some people's points that it didn't really make it a lot. Like, and yeah. I turned it into, but I still but thought no, it was overall better. But I, I did yeah. too. Well, I, I, I honestly, I I do refactorings and and code structure changes for that exact reason on a yeah. regular basis. Yeah. And yeah. I have never once thought to myself, "Oh, that was terrible. I shouldn't have done that afterwards." Well, it, and, it, and even it, if you pull, yeah. Even if you pull out a one-line method just to get a name, yeah, yeah. that that exactly. method is not going to drive code like a comment does. You know, like right, yeah. people hit return, like they see your comment and they put, they're like, oh, well, I want to add something after this, and pretty soon, you know, so there's half a screen between the right. comment and the actual code it was originally. But I, I do that on code that doesn't even have comments. I'll take an if statement that has, yeah, you know, a, a left and a right side. If this, whatever that. I'll yeah. take the mm -hmm. actual evaluation out and give it a named variable, one line above. Yeah, yeah I do that. Yep. Because I want the if statement to say if mm -hmm. condition. I don't exactly. want it to have right. syntax and deal with, well, yeah. what did this actually mean? What was the condition that I was really looking for? I want, I want those names. Yeah. I want it to be. It's important. Mm -hmm. I got a really good glimpse of the horror that ensues when you can't really do that. Recently, I was working with some <laughs> stored procedures. Oh yay! It was there was like a um, it was 500 line stored procedure. Yeah. And it was impossible. I mean, there was literally, unless you were the one who wrote it, it's there's literally no way to know what the intent is. Yep. And it was just it was it was oh it was so awful. I mean, yeah. there were and there were there were actually a decent number of comments in there. But it's like, okay, well, what, you, you're doing this union. Like, what is this? You know, what is the intent of that? I have no freaking clue, and there's no clues to it in the in the code at all. Yay! <laughs> but um, but yeah, John, that, that on what you were, on, okay. I wanted to say one thing on what you were saying. So, James Clear had a really good blog post a few weeks ago where he talked about two, two kinds of growth. I don't know if you you follow him much, but um, there the, he had he had these two graphs, right? And there's like there's some things in life that are exponential and the curve kind of like starts off slow and then it shoots up and then there's others that are like you know the curve shoots up and then levels off right kind of like the opposite they're basically just mirrors of each other and you're hitting like web he was saying in the article actually that web traffic is exponential but yeah. I actually don't really think that's true because what you're seeing is that with with your current production you're hitting that that increment, you know, the, the point where the each additional blog post really doesn't get you anywhere. Uh, so you yeah, need to flip yeah. that. You need to flip. Yeah. But what you're doing is going. You're finding a way to flip that around exactly, by increasing yeah. your production. And yeah, so that's yeah, that's pretty cool. And and, and it's and I mean, even if I just keep going at this rate, it'll it's still technically I'm still on an exponential yeah. growth curve, right? Because I'm doubling every year in in traffic. But uh, but it's over that. Period of yeah, a longer period of time. But by 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 making it seven blog posts a week, if if I get to that point, then I think it'll it'll really start to you know to exponentially grow. Um, but yeah, it's it's interesting. Like um, you know, and, and I've also had a lot of see. It's, it's kind of weird because I had a bunch of like when I look at my top posts, like the ultimate uh, the top traffic every day is like you know some of them are. The Joel test one, right? Because right. <laughs> these are all recent too. It's funny. The eleven rules all programmers should live by: ultimate list of programming books, ultimate list of developer podcasts. Right. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting, but but definitely by increasing traffic, I increase increase revenue for sure with simple programmers. So, mm -hmm. um, so I definitely want to want to keep getting getting traffic going there. But yeah. Hmm. It's uh, but I like what you said about editor. That makes a lot of sense. I think to to do that, that's that that probably would be money well spent. I just got to find a good editor now. Yeah, take your time on that. <laughs> yeah, I, I wonder if I should put a like. I guess they should be technical, right? It should be someone who's yes in the software development community. So um, and uh, and and has some kind of a journalistic background as well. Mm-hmm. I'm wondering if I should. Do uh, you think it's good to? S I guess I could send out a blast to my list. I could do like the whole Tim Ferriss job application thing, and you know, say like why you know have them, you know, fill out this really long kind of survey so that I weed people out. Yeah, we need to. We need to. We need to have a Tim Ferriss mention in every episode just so I can <laughs> see Derek's face drop. It's great. 
<laughs> it's a meme. But I'm actually gonna reuse the comments thing too. Like I every time I post anything about comments. Nice. Like, so I yeah. can do another follow up and show another real world example. I could be like, okay, for you guys that didn't like this one, I can understand why. Here's another one, and then people <laughs> go all nuts again about comments. And, yeah, yeah. And it's Are totally there legitimate. any hot buttons like that that you could that you could push? That's definitely a good one. Did you see the? Um, did you guys see the Stack Overflow survey that went around? Uh -huh. Um, like there was like a Stack Overflow survey where they did like. They they had a one of the um, like it was like a bunch of questions like what's your favorite text editor, um, yeah. and actually Notepad plus plus won out beating beat out Sublime, um, but uh, one of the questions was we all know that Vim is the only editor worth using. So well, Vim and actually Emacs was comically small like it was really? like four wow. percent. Oh yeah yeah, the Emacs people are very vocal but they're a very yeah. tiny minority, um, but. Uh, yeah, one of the questions was tabs versus spaces, and I was shocked. It was like 65, 40, 65, 35 in favor of tabs. Really? Yes. I which tabs. I yeah, I know. I I was shocked, but huh. yep. Apparently, it, so yeah. you could get tabs versus spaces. That's always popular on my yeah uh, the blind <laughs> list. Yeah, you know, that's a good idea. Tabs, tabs versus, versus spaces and comma first JavaScript variables. Oh comma yeah! First. Oh yeah! yeah. Freaking <laughs> freaking hate comma first. I, I what, wanna, what's comma code. first? So if you have a list of variables, I'll type this into the chat window. Uh -huh. uh, you you separate one variable per line. Say var foo equals var, and then space uh, comma bad equals whatever space comma this you know. Yeah, so basically, you put your so phone on a line. Is, what right. the hell? Because you don't want to type var? <laughs> yeah, so you can you can do comma separated variables, uh, and the yeah. and, and and people do comma first instead of comma last, which would be more like var two equals var yeah. comma this equals that comma whatever okay, equals yeah. something comma. That's, yeah. that's readable. Yeah, comma last <laughs> is easier to read and understand. People do comma first because they're damn lazy typists, and they don't <laughs> want to have. They 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 apparently change their code so often that they don't want to have to move the location of the comma to remove one line. They just want to comment out that one line and move on. What the hell? I, I mean, exactly. To be honest, I don't like. I really don't like either of those. I would just put var in front of every line, yeah. every variable I declare That's, separately. I, I typically do that too. The only time I have comma separated variable declarations is if there are no assignments. Var foo, yeah, yeah. sure. Foo comma bar comma baz, you know, semicolon. Okay, there's three variables that are unassigned. But then yeah. I have var foo equals bar semicolon var baz equals <laughs> cooks semicolon. Bunch of programmers. Verbal, <laughs> verbal programming. Yeah, right. yeah exactly. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, that's a good... I mean, there's definitely yeah. some hot buttons. Yeah, yeah. You, you, will, you will get a thousand comments. And you, definitely need to, you definitely need to bring the, uh, the testing thing back, too. Right. The automated testing. To, yeah, yeah. yeah. Look, yeah. look up, look up, do some reading on automatic semicolon insertion ASI with JavaScript. <laughs> that is fodder for a dozen blog posts that oh will make thousands yeah. of, of hatred comments. That oh, that one's actually bit me before. Just yeah, I. If you don't put comments, put semicolons in your JavaScript, JavaScript, I hate you. Yeah. That's, yeah. That's what, unless you're doing Node, okay? If you're talking about yeah. Node, I don't care. If you're talking about the browser and you purposely leave out semicolons, I hate you. <laughs> you're an awful person, and you should never release <laughs> anything as open source. It, it, it's horrible that they put that into the language itself, just because, yeah. like, yeah. I mean, it bites me. It bit me so hard with a with a with a loop, where yeah. it automatically it was it was running an empty loop, and I'm like, right. what the hell? It's because it was automatically. <laughs> Starting the semicolon for me. Yep. Because I was trying to be smart and like divide, you know, put onto a separate line, like right. every, and then it was like, so it was making a for loop that was just just doing nothing, and I was like, how the hell is this even working? You know. <laughs> yeah. So thanks a lot, for people who can't type semicolons. You screwed Seriously. up the world for everyone. If your aesthetic means that I can't actually use your code, you're an asshole. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, uh, but but yeah. Oh, the other piece about doing this extra content is right now, like I'm doing three YouTube videos. Oh, I forgot to mention, I'm I have everything being transcribed now, which is pretty nice. Awesome. Oh, yes. So, well, speaking of, yeah, I'm using Rev.com for transcriptions. Totally uh, worth it. It's awesome. Dude, isn't but it? That's like, I mean, I, I just while we were sitting here talking, I uploaded two more videos to them. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I've got to get how to market yourself, but but yeah. I've got um so I've got uh, a girl in the Philippines that's doing uh, she does my three YouTube videos and the Get Up and Code podcast every week nice. for thirty bucks. Wow, so nice. that's yeah. that's well worth it. Um, yeah. And my VA is working directly with her, so I don't even haven't even talked with her. He just <laughs> has that coordinate. I just pay her. Nice. And um, yeah. but the the cool thing about that is so now that I'm doing those YouTube videos right and putting the transcriptions in there. Uh, What's been holding me back is I, I do one I do a, a every Thursday there's a blog post uh, that's my YouTube video essentially, uh, it, which is the most popular YouTube video from the three I released the previous week. So that's how I have it set up. But if I can get to the point where I'm producing seven pieces of content of of blog posts on Simple Programmer a week or even just three or four, then I can include all of those YouTube videos. Right right now, if I were to release every single YouTube video I do. Because uh, I do three a week on Simple Programmer, the problem would be that it would be three to one ratio of of YouTube videos to blog posts, and then all of a sudden Simple Programmer becomes a a vlog instead of a. Right. <laughs> uh, and, and I don't really want to go there. Like, yeah, you know what I mean, I want it. I don't want it to be seventy five percent video content. Yeah. Um, so if I can do that, then all of a sudden I get all this extra bonus content on Simple mm. Programmer. So yeah, so that's kind of. The the big vision for that, but but yeah, nice. I think I can I can double if I can if I can get that figured out. But the the editor that's gonna be I gotta figure out how to hire one. If I get a good editor, that'll be awesome. Do you know anybody that's uh, done like traditional publishing of magazines? Because that's exactly the kind of position that they would hire. I've 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 worked with a, a quote editor, managing editor, whatever you want to call him, um, a number of times at at .dot net magazine. Um, or, or what was it, Code Magazine, uh -huh. and, and, and that's, that's all he did, exactly what Josh just, just described. He would go out and find authors to talk on subjects. He would organize the articles into issues and then, um, and then, and then essentially coordinate everything with the actual, to get it all to the actual publisher who would then go and, and put it all together. But he, it's, it's a common thing in the yeah. publishing world so it's it's got to be it's it's going to be something that you sh you should be able to find if you can just figure out the right keywords to look for in in the service that you're looking for. Okay, yeah, I'll have to check for Josh for the site point editors. Are they part time? Um, yes. So yes. maybe I could start talking to some of them or other <laughs> right? right and say, hey, would you uh -huh. like another part time job? Like, right? Uh, I, I don't. For the record, and, this was not my idea. Yeah. <laughs> well, and they could they could they could utilize some of the same people too, right? Yeah. You know, so double their if you reach out to someone who's writing an article. Uh, by the way, I did get my SitePoint article published too. Nice. Well, uh, what did you do it on again? And it did really well. Uh, t uh, creating a Chrome plugin in ten minutes. Okay. Uh, a Chrome extension in ten minutes. Nice. I wonder if it's still coming in. I had a lot of traffic that was coming in from it, so it must have done. Well, let me see if I can find it. Uh, or let's say creating a Chrome plugin extension. I wonder if it'll come up in like one of the top results. Uh, doesn't look like it, but if I put in ten minutes, I'm sure it will. <laughs> So, uh, so yeah, so Josh, thanks for that uh, reference. But it's been it's been getting actually good direct traffic. So I don't have any way of telling how many views it had on SitePoint. Yeah, awesome. I did remember actually the one thing one one other thing I wanted to add um, when we were talking about redirects. So remember how I said that my book sales had really dropped off? Right. Um, well, I discovered this week while I was putting my portfolio together that sublimeproductivity.com was going to a directory page. <laughs> what? <laughs> Instead of... No! I, yeah, I don't understand. Okay, so I basically, a few months ago, I 
re I pointed it to um, I took down my my site that I was using to sell it with TPD and just pointed the domain back to LeanPub. Uh -huh. And somehow the www version of it is is working and going to the LeanPub page, but the 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 regular version which I have not uh, which is what the version I've used everywhere is going to basically a directory on some web server that I cannot I don't even know if it's my own web server or if it's leanpub or what like wow. I don't know um, the the IP addresses I had my server guy look at it and he wasn't sure what was going on either so the the IP addresses that come back for those two the WW versus the straight up version are, are one number off huh um, they're both in in my in uh, namecheap.com my DNS. They're both pointed to the same. They're po pointed to a URL. Um, it's the like a, a redirect to the the re the URL on LeanPub, um, and it, neither neither of those IP addresses matches my server or the LeanPub server. <laughs> so. Got I don't know hijacking going on in there. Or something. I think you domain parking on the <coughs> you, the name server could do it if you don't have it directed anywhere. Uh, well, I had it directed. No, it's it's like it's just it it was literally just like an empty it was like an empty directory type of page that it was going to. Do you have so, it fixed now? Well, what we did was yeah, actually, I think let me confirm that it's actually working. What but is the site? What we did, uh, sublimeproductivity.com. Oh. Let me check it. See if it's working. I think it's working. Yeah, it's working now. So I guess yeah. it was going to my server somehow still, and so my server guy just set up a um, basically like a stub in uh, Nginx to redirect it to LeanPub. So now I've got right. I've got the traffic going. So that might actually help because I was down to like I was only selling like around one hundred and fifty dollars a month, <laughs> which it, it seemed like it had leveled off around four or five hundred a month. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, which was nice because it was covering the the mailing list cost right. basically. Um, so yeah, so hopefully I can get that. Hopefully that'll bounce back now. When did you make this fix? Um, just like last, uh, I think it was earlier this week actually. Uh, lesson learned, I guess. When you start to see sales drop, like when you see a change yeah. in numbers, you got to investigate well, it. Yeah, yeah well, it was like a steady, but it was it had been steadily declining. So I was yeah. just kind of like, man, it's just continuing the downward yeah. trend. I bet that doubles your sales. Yeah, it might. I, I, would, I think it's going to help. Yeah. Um, I've also seen some, like, I'd also seen, like, basically all of the bundle sales dry up. Um, and I've, this week I've seen some bundle sales come through from, like, other people's books. So I'm, so, now I'm getting a little, so I'm getting a little bit more of a boost off of other people's books again. You need to hire a ghostwriter to finish that book. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm thinking I'm going to dive back into it. Yeah, because you're in the like near future. Six, yeah, six well, it, it's really uh, that number's arbitrary too. I mean, yeah. it's 150 pages, which is longer than most, probably longer than most of the books on LeanPub. I just need to like draw a line in the sand and say, okay, here's what I'm going to add to it, and yeah. just call it done. Man, my uh, backbone book is 250. Well, you're that's pretty that's pretty impressive. But yeah, I bet a lot of them are short, shorter than that. Yeah, so, yeah, they are. yeah, a lot of them are. Like the my my Rabbit MQ book is like seventy. Yeah, yeah, and that's a pretty good length for e like a you know for an ebook like that. Right. Twenty thousand words is kind of a good a good sweet spot. Yeah. How about that follow liker? Man, that thing is working. Oh like my god! <laughs> you guys are so freaking. <laughs> I mean, if, if anybody has ever been called a spammer on this show, it's you. No. <laughs> it's awesome. I'm just growing. My Twitter is just growing. It's great. Yeah, I mean, follow like, like her is, is pretty, pretty interesting. It's, um, I continue to just be absolutely appalled by the UI on this. Like, yeah. the funny thing is, if you go to the Follow Like Her website and you look, they have screenshots, okay? Yeah. And it is like an anti-advertisement for the product because it's like, it's a screenshot of like a big empty screen. Like they had, they, the guy has like this, you know, 4K monitor, all right, and he's got he's got Follow Liker maximized on this 4K monitor, and <laughs> all Follow Liker is is a freaking menu across the top of the screen. So it's like there's a menu across the top of the screen and like one Twitter account, and that's it. And then like this big empty screen. It's it's, it's like the worst. It's got to be the worst product shot ever. But you know what? That just goes to show you. Well, I don't know how well they're doing. I'm assuming they're doing well. But uh, that that the most important thing is is that product market fit or oh, that totally is, is marketing. That, 
it's the, it's the, well, no, it's the product. It's it's the yeah. solution to the problem. Like you could, right. you could just like not know how to sell the thing or you know or package it or it looks like crap. But you know what? If this thing works, I don't care how difficult it is. This is such a problem for me that it that I will pay whatever you ask to solve this problem for me. Like even if you give me the crappiest UI ever. Right. This is like yep. I don't. I don't even give a shit. Just take my money because I because I don't. I don't care. Right. right. Well, and that's only true though when you're the first person in the market. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, if uh, so, basically, follow liker is what um, tweet adder used to be, and if tweet adder, you know, would go back to that, I would totally switch back and I'd pay a lot more money because the UI. Like I with this, I don't even have a lot of confidence in the product because. <laughs> UI is so bad. I don't even know if it's working. <laughs> My, mine's working. I'm, yeah. Yeah. I'm at like 18.7k followers on Twitter now. So. Wow. Nice. But, uh, but yeah, I'm glad. I'm glad to have found it. Even it, I'm glad that tweet adder broke on me. <laughs> <laughs> and then they blamed. Like I went to the forum for tweet yeah. adder. I was like, what the hell's going on? And they blamed the users. They're like, because some of you guys, like, uh, use this to follow too aggressively, you know. I'm like, what the, wh how the hell are you supposed to use this thing? Like, you, you follow, like, ten people a day or something? I, I don't even understand how the, the intended usage is supposed to be at this point. Yeah, I think it's, like, I think here, it's, like, one of those things where this, or it's sort of, the sort of black hat, and, they, like, they basically exist at Twitter's whim, Mm -hmm. Yeah, and all Twitter has to do is turn off their API key, and they're done. Their company's gone. It's yeah. true. Yeah, and it's a terrible business model. But so they're basically kind of at Twitter's mercy, and you know, like technically, this is probably not. You know, probably this all violates Twitter's terms of service. Totally. But Twitter lets it go on. Yeah. Um, because it's small enough that they don't care. They don't notice it. Yeah. And yeah. then when something like Tweet Adder gets big enough, Twitter notices it, and then yep. they start complaining to Tweet Adder, and then Tweet Adder yeah. starts blaming users. Yeah. Yep. And I think Follow Liker is just not at that point yet, yeah. so it'll it'll happen. I doubt it, like considering it. how god awful it is. <laughs> <laughs> that might be some of their secret sauces. Like, yeah, yeah. Like they may have purposely you have made to it so want dang it. awful. Yeah, you Twitter wanted it pretty bad. To, yeah, they might download it and then they're like, "What the? What is this crap? Nobody can like, use this, can use yeah, this crap? Yeah, forget yeah. it. Not worth our time. Looks like <laughs> amateurs." <laughs> so, um, well, got uh, a, got a question. Uh, so, um, I my MacBook should be arriving today. Yep. Um, so I'm actually thinking I'm going to I'm considering migrating the MacBook that I'm using right now to that one with the migration tool. Is yep. that a horrible idea, or is that a good good thing? Phenomenal idea. Um, okay. If if for nothing else, um, migrate all your data. You okay. know, maybe you don't want to migrate all your applications and and configuration because you might want to start clean and not install so much stuff. But if if you really do want everything, that migration mm -hmm. utility is amazing. Okay. Three hours later, you'll have a Mac, a brand new MacBook that nice. has. Literally everything from your old MacBook, as if you Sweet. had never, as if you had always had that one. That's exactly what I want. Yeah, so the, I think I will. I think yeah, I'm just going to migrate all the programs and everything yeah. too. Yeah, the so. the the Apple Time Machine and migration utilities are the light years beyond anything that I've ever yeah. used in Windows. Nice. Yeah, that's always the pain point with Windows for me. Is yeah, you, know, it's just you get like a new box, you're gonna process. install everything from scratch. You want to upgrade yeah. Windows, you're gonna install everything from scratch. You sneeze too yeah. hard, you're gonna install everything <laughs> from scratch. We did get a track about this. Was really cool. Um, I I got to help out a little bit. Um, it used to be like a th you guys know it was like a three day process to get right. your box set up when you started or if you needed to repave because yep. we had to install. Visual Studio and SQL and yep. all those security you know, certificates. And then tons and of, just, yeah, the security yeah. certificates, which would eat six hours of your life yep. every single time. Um, so we got that all automated. Um, one nice. of the other, guys, other developers has been working on it. So it's nice. basically completely automated with Chef and Puppet. Nice. So you run a script and it will just boom. It just, I mean, it builds out a standard box and then you can customize it from there. And yeah, awesome. you just you have to sit there and click through. We did. Um, Make it so you have to click through some of the GUI, right. like some of the GUI installers for like Visual Studio and stuff. But yeah, uh, default configuration like with SQL, I never knew what to add. Like yep. I never knew what 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 do I need. I had no idea. <laughs> and so like it's all pre-configured. You just next 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 boom install. Nice. That's awesome. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's pretty uh, sweet. So we can rebuild servers now and rebuild dev boxes. Very nice. Yep. Oh, so for the for the tech portion of our show, then um, I've got a few. So oh, I I did I switched to one 4K monitor. Yeah, oh, that's okay. what I'm using. I've I've put the other one to the side, and I just have the one now. Okay. And I think that's better because the two was just too wide. So yeah. I was focusing at the split of the right. two. Yeah. Yeah. And I wasn't seeing the peripherals very much, so I think I'm going to stick with this setup. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly the same kind of problem I had with multi-monitors when I was doing yeah. that. And this, the, even the 27-inch, I mean, it's not 4K, but it's a big monitor, and it's a beautiful monitor. And it's, it's enough that I, I literally have to, to look back and forth, up and down, especially with my glasses and the focal point yeah. glasses. So, I mean, I... I I don't recommend multi-monitor anymore. I think it's a giant waste of, of, of resources on your laptop, and it's more of a distraction than anything. It, now that we have 4K monitors as an option, I think that... Yeah. I mean, my ideal... Now I know what my ideal is. I want one 5K monitor that's curved, that, right. that's, that has a nice, nice, good curve to it so it wraps around a little bit. Mm-hmm. So that then that would be perfect, you know, because you're right in your peripherals, um, yeah, yeah. and you can utilize that. Um, but now what I'm considering also is I'm trying to figure my computer is is the one that I had from track about actually, mm-hmm. right? Desktop. So I'm due for an upgrade. Uh, so I'm gonna ask Larry. <laughs> hey, Larry, I know I haven't worked for you in how long has it been, but... It's been, it's been two years have rolled around, so... It's, yeah, that contract we signed, it didn't say anything about it, that that contract terminated with employment, so... Yeah, so... <laughs> uh, but uh, here's what I'm thinking about doing. Uh, I wanted to run this by you guys as a test to, to see. So majority of my work now is web-based and writing an email, right? Mm-hmm. It's not even not even video editing anymore. Right. So I'm wondering if I could get away with the new Mac. Oh, totally. Right? And oh, then the MacBook. Right. And then just and I still need a powerful machine because sometimes I do need to do video editing. Sometimes right. I do need to do some um, so I was thinking about keeping my existing regular desktop machine, but basically transitioning to like maybe getting rid of my MacBook Pro. And then, because what do I really use that for? Like, and then just getting the new Mac, which will be light and travel, you know, very travel friendly. And then my my setup, eventually replacing my desktop with the next generation of the of the Mac 5K, right. this, you know, iMac. Not this generation because the graphics card is is crap for the, you know. But right. the ne- by that time, I think this one will age. But does that sound like now the only problem, the only other piece to this, which I think Josh, you talked about this before, is I need to run Follow Liker. So right. I need like a VM, <laughs> like a can I get a Windows VM in the cloud for pretty cheap and just run you can Follow get an, Liker on there? Well, the Azure VM that I'm looking at is like uh, thirteen bucks a month. And that's oh. if you leave it on all the time. Well, with well, Follow that's... Liker, we'd need to. Oh, okay. I've but got yeah. credits for BizSpark anyway, so I could probably right. be yeah. free. But yeah, yeah I, th- I think um, the only caveat I would say to that plan is you might want to wait until the next MacBook comes out because mm-hmm. this being the first version of it, there are some, yeah, okay, this is nice, but moments yeah. in it. Um, go read the Ars Technica review of the new MacBook and yeah. and you'll get a better idea of whether or not it will work for you. But I think in general, I, I think the idea is is solid for, for what you do with with your business at this point. I don't think you need anything more than that at this point. Okay. Yeah. The the other possibility would be to wait till the new MacBook Pro fifteen inch comes out and just Which is- buy the super yeah. most upgraded version of that, and just use that. That's what I'm doing. I'm 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 sitting at two and a half years on my current 15-inch MacBook Pro, and once they drop the next upgrade of the 15-inch MacBook Pro with the you know everything in it, I'm going to be upgrading to that one. Yeah, if it were me, I'd, I'd prefer the small and light version, right. and have some other option for the workhorse. Like I'd rather split that up. Okay. Yeah. Ninety-five yeah, percent of the time, you're gonna appreciate the small and light version. 
to me, lot. the the big beefy MacBook Pro with everything in it is the small life, small and light version. <laughs> I mean, the, for, I, for for all the work I do, because yeah, I run virtual yeah. machines off this, I do video right, editing, right, right. And video encoding, and, and so I, I do everything yeah. on this. So for me, you know, it's it's yeah. worth it. But for what you guys do, yeah, totally that that new MacBook. Yeah, I I looked at it. I was really ex- I was excited about the idea until I like read the reviews. So right. if, John, if you haven't read them, definitely. I was yeah, like I was yeah. pretty gung ho and was wanting to buy it, and then I read the reviews. It's it's what I don't like about it is um, it's funny. I was actually talking to Larry about this in a one on one recently, and it's like it's actually things are actually getting worse because in terms of like laptops because everything is so underpowered now because they're all competing on battery power. Right. And they have to drive these huge screens. Right. So yeah. you know, so like the processors are like it's it's tough to even hook up an external monitor to some of these new new Mac or yeah. new, not maybe not the MacBooks, but the certainly the Windows like Ultrabooks. Right. It's it's tough to even get acceptable video performance out of it. Yeah, you'll you you'll get one screen. Thunderbolt monitor out of the MacBook. I don't. It, it it can probably do. I think it can do a 4K monitor just fine. But you, I think they gotta, said it, the reviews I saw said that it was struggling a little bit okay. with 4K. But you also have to remember that this is a mobile processor. This is not a standard right. laptop yeah. processor. Even this is like yeah. what you would get in a MacBook Air or an iPad, right. quite honestly. Because the actual processing device with all the memory and hard drive is this tiny little card, no bigger than the the iPhone 6 Plus. And the vast majority of the space in that laptop, the new MacBook, is battery. battery. Yeah. 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 The nice thing about the Apple stuff, though, too, is that, like, if you you can always just upgrade, yeah. and it retains its value so much that mm-hmm. you just pay the difference. Like, it's... Right. You know, yeah. so that's... The, like, whereas if yeah. you buy a Windows PC laptop, right. you're like, you're throw I bought away. $1,200, <laughs> and now I can sell it for 300 Great. Yeah, right. I always buy I always buy Windows PCs used whenever right. I can. Yeah, because it's that you're right. There's a depreciate. It's like a it's like a new new car. <laughs> With a Mac, it's like it's um like you, they seriously like you can buy an iPad that's a year old and it's like a hundred dollars cheaper than the than it was brand new. It's like yeah. barely you know barely more than the cost of shipping. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I'll have to think about it a little bit. The other possibility that would that influence my decision would be if I could do video editing in the cloud, mm-hmm. then I wouldn't need a powerful computer at all. Try then, it out. It's really, I mean, it would take you in a couple hours tops. Just yeah, log into Azure and spin one up and install Camtasia or whatever you use and just see see if the experience is workable. I did it with SQL. I, when I was working on that project um, to automate the... The uh, dev box set up for track about. Um, I needed a clean, clean environment to mess with SQL because SQL was installed mm-hmm. on my machine, and I need to be able to like run the installer. And you right. can't do that once it's like installed because um, it turns into like an updater. But I just, yeah, I just spun up a VM, threw a bunch of, threw a bunch of RAM and CPU at it, and I couldn't tell I wasn't on my local machine. It was that good. Nice. Um, you I mean you're limited to having it, having to have an internet connection, but. I was really impressed, and actually, it was better than my local machine because that that my Windows laptop has always been kind of a dog. Right. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll I'll, I'll have to think about it. I might I might do, I mean because I'm going to be going to Europe for three months, so it might be worth even if it's just a. I mm-hmm. mean that that new MacBook's only like what twelve hundred bucks or so for. Yeah. Right. So it might be worth the investment just for that, and then if it didn't work out, I could always get rid of it. So. It could become the next surface. Yeah, <laughs> it's just a hard debate between that and 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 getting the fully upgraded next MacBook Pro 15 inch because then that's like that does everything. Well, but, but price wise, it's going to be like three thousand dollars probably. Thirty five hundred, right? Thirty five hundred. Mm-hmm. So that's a pretty big jump. It's that was what I was looking at with my jump. laptop. Like to buy, I was thinking about buying a spec out, spec out like. Right. Thirteen inch, and it was going to be close to close to at least twenty five hundred bucks. But this would replace my desktop as well, so yeah. that's why I'm yeah. saying it's a qu- almost yeah. equivalent price. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah, so it's, pricing is interesting because you hear people complaining about the Apple tax, which I th- that really is a thing. They clearly make a lot of money off of these. But if you actually spend 
if, if, if you spec out the truly the same Windows laptop as MacBook Pro, top of the line MacBook Pro, you're also going to spend thirty five hundred. People people go and and buy these you know fifteen hundred dollar Windows machines, claiming that it's as fast and powerful as the top of the line MacBook Pro, but it's nowhere near the same. It, I mean, it, it's like yeah. saying a nineteen eighty five Oldsmobile is the same as a two thousand and ten you know Ford Explorer or something. Yeah, okay, you can you can haul stuff in it and it works, but it's no. It's it's a, the the quality of of hardware and parts and whatnot is is really is better in Macs most of the time, but you you can get as good quality in a Windows box. You just got to spend the same yeah. amount of money. Yeah. Yeah, almost there are like virtually no manufacturers that actually make that's the main, actually the main reason for me why I'm yeah. getting another Mac is because nobody in when nobody put makes a Windows machine that nice. Right. <laughs> nobody. Yeah. When, Windows laptops are in a race to the bottom. Yeah. I prefer. I. Pre, I mean. I honestly. It feels like to me like a breath of fresh air whenever I go back to my Windows machine because I just like it better. Right. But I can't. But yeah, I just can't get. Just give it, give it a year. I, I felt the same way for the first two years that I had the Mac. Oh, I've, I've been using Macs off and on for like four years. Right, so. but it, once you get into it full time, that's what made the difference for me. Yeah. I've been using I, this I, full time for two years, though. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I just, it's hard to overcome 20 years of. Yeah. But I, I was the same way, but. but you've been I, using the web browser in it, right, Josh? It's like. <laughs> <laughs> you've essentially been using the web browser on a Mac, right? right? I mean. No, I mean I've been using I've been using it for development for two years. Oh right, for have, oh yeah, okay, you're doing iOS development. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, that's true. Okay. Once you yeah. start doing other stuff like do do more command line based things and I've I've done a lot of that. Yeah, I, I know Bash and stuff yeah. and. It's just, I, I can't go back to Windows at this point. I get confused in Windows now. It's like where is uh, how do I uh, especially Windows eight. <laughs> I agree with you. Just with wait that. for Windows 10. Yeah, Windows 10 looks interesting. I think they're they're. It's kind of sad to see some of the things they're taking away from Windows 8, because a lot of that is just yeah. stupid people that that are afraid of changing. I I think I think there was a lot of good things in Windows 8 that that didn't get a fair shake because people are just oh you changed it. Yeah. yeah. You know. But anyways. All right, we should probably tie a bow on this. Hopefully this one actually goes to the recorded videos and yeah. doesn't, I don't have to get Google. Uh, I'm surprised, though. They actually did fix my problem from their forum, from the oh, Google wow. product forum. Oh, wow. Nice. So so that is a way to actually get I, I was like, there's no, I'm not going to post here. This is just stupid. Like right. I see all these people with non-answered things, but they, <laughs> they got it fixed. So Wow, nice. So, yeah, hopefully this one will just show up and not have a problem. <laughs> yep. All right, thoughts. Sweet. You guys got thoughts for thought the for the week. week. Um, I'm drawing a blank. <laughs> wow, we need a hard edit here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I can jump in here. I'll 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 rescue Derek. Um, so this is kind of piggybacking off of John's pairs, but um, f like physical the physical stuff always beats virtual. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. like it just does. No, you're right. Um. So I had uh, applied for that that position or that you know that the part time thing with Ryan Levesque a couple, few weeks back, and I didn't I don't think I got it. Um, but I did I did get several people to recommend or to like mention me to him, and so I've I've been sending thank you gifts to those people, and I sent um, the one guy I know he's like really into um, little league umpiring, and. So I found an antique, like an old antique book about Little League umpiring, and I, I bought it on eBay for like two bucks, and I sent it to him. Nice. And, you know, he emailed me back, and he was all excited about it. So, like, you know, that type of thing. Even, like, a thank you email is better than nothing, but if you send somebody a handwritten note and something in the mail, like, that just puts you so far ahead of everybody else. Yeah, right. I guess I'll go with uh, sometimes... Doing it yourself is worth it just to learn something new. Because we, we talk a, a lot about, you know, hiring people to do things for us. And, and a couple of days ago, I was reaching out on Twitter trying to see if anybody had a recommendation for somebody to build this video intro 
for me. Just, you know, slide, motion, title, whatnot for all the interviews that I'm doing. And, and I, I looked around, and there were people that could do it, and I was like, you know, I don't... I would rather spend the time learning Motion 5 a little better than I currently know it just because I want to learn something different, something new, something that I don't normally do. It's interesting to me right now. And so I'm, I'm spending the time doing it. It's not going to be as good as if somebody else had done it for me. It's taking me ten times longer, but I'm okay with that because I wanted to do it just for the experience of doing it. Awesome. And I, I don't have a good one. <laughs> wow. Well, what, what, what did you, your email this week was good. The, uh, uh, on, the I am an entrepreneur. Yeah, actually, maybe that's it. You know, it's like uh, maybe about about setting it, it, you know, setting a big goal, setting a big yeah. big dream. I think people dream a little bit small, and they don't realize that that they they can achieve things that are, are beyond. You know, I, I think back, you know, five years ago, my goals. I've gone so far past those goals mm -hmm. that I thought were impossible to obtain. That uh, that it, it's amazing. I couldn't. My my previous self five years ago would have no would not believe at all that it'd be possible for me to be where I am today. Mm, right. um, and so that means I was setting my goals way too small, and and I'm probably even still setting them too small. So you know, it's, uh, it's set those those dreams higher than than what you think you can achieve. Dream big. Um, yeah, dream big. So cool. All yeah. right, guys. Uh, See next, you next week. Yep. Oh, right. we have to figure out something too. By the way, uh, for when I'm in Europe, we're gonna have to look at oh, right. time zones. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> That'll be fun. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, I interviewed somebody that was in Sweden. That was a six-hour six time difference. And then uh, Carl at Cloud AMQP. He's from Sweden, but he's in Indonesia right now. Yeah. That oh. was a thirteen-hour time difference. So I yeah. interviewed him at nine a.m. here, ten p.m. over there. Nice. <laughs> that was crazy. All right, guys. Same right. bad time, same bad channel. See ya. All right. See ya. Wanna start a business, but you just know how to code. Listen to John, Josh, and Derek as we figure it out. We are the entrepreneurs, and we'll teach you straight up.